Sorry, we're waiting for live stream. Okay, I'd like to call Comox Valley Regional District board meeting of July 14th, 2020 to order. And before we begin, I'd like to provide a brief statement respecting the protocols for this meeting. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, CVRD open meetings have been closed to the public for the past several months in accordance with provincial ministerial orders. And in an effort to ensure the health and safety of the public the staff and directors. I'm pleased to advise that in-person attendance is once again permitted. The reopening of the corporate office and the CBRD meetings has been carefully considered and informed through the development of the CBRD's COVID-19 safety plan and the orders and advice of the public health authorities. All visitors to the office will encounter new protocols and features aligned with this plan, including hand sanitizing upon entry to the building, as meetings are being recorded and live streamed to the CVRD's website, we encourage the public to continue to make use of these online opportunities. For those that attend in person, please note that physical distancing must be maintained and the maximum meeting room capacity of 30 people will be strictly enforced. We also ask that you exit the civic room through the back doors to the left next to, to the board, the school board office to reduce crowding in the hallway and lobby. We thank you for your patience and cooperation during these unprecedented times. So I'd like to recognize that we're on the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. And I'm going to read Article 13 of UNDRIP today. Indigenous peoples have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their histories, languages, oral traditions, philosophies, writing systems, and literatures, and to designate and retain their own names for communities, places, and persons. And states shall take effective measures to ensure that this right is protected, and also to ensure that Indigenous peoples can understand and be understood in political, legal, administrative proceedings where necessary through the provision of interpretation or by other appropriate means. And with that, we move to the in-camera recommendation. I'll move the recommendation. Second. Second. Thank you. And the recommendation is that the board adjourn to an in-camera session pursuant to the following subsections of Section 9 of the Community Charter, 91K, negotiations and related discussions respecting the proposed provision of a regional district service that are at their preliminary stages and that in the view of the committee or board, could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the regional district if they were held in public. And finally, that the in-camera portion convene immediately following the portion of the open meeting. Any objection to moving in camera? Seeing and hearing none, that's carried. And we're on to C, adoption of minutes from June 23rd. Move. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion about the, uh, the minutes? And is there any opposition to the minutes? Okay, seeing and hearing none, those are adopted. And we're on to D, business rising for minutes. Oh, sorry, no, we're on to E, delegations. And today we have Julie mi Mixed, Mixed, sorry. <laughs> um, clearing of vegetated and forest lands. Um, and she's a biologist and environmental science uh, from you no know, with an environmental science background, and she's going to talk to us today about the Wildlife and Migratory Bird Conventions Act. Move your seat. Second. Thanks so much. So testing. Is that okay? Okay. Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> Can you 
Can you hear if the everybody could mute, there's a bunch of echoes going on. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for having me here today. This is my first time um, speaking as a delegate. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity. So my name is Julie Mix, and I'm a local resident of the Comox Valley and have worked as an environmental consultant for the past 20 years. I have assessed undeveloped and partially developed lands for wildlife values for the provincial government, developers, industry, and NGOs throughout Vancouver Island, BC, and in the Comox Valley. And I have completed Eagle and um, Great Blue Heron nest assessments for Courtney, Comox, and the regional district. I'm here today to discuss the importance of protecting environmentally valuable resources such as songbirds through preliminary site assessments and bird nest assessments as described by the Develop with Care program that was developed by the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations and the Ministry of Environment. So I did have a presentation, um, sorry, I should have probably mentioned that beforehand. That should come up here. Yep, staff is looking into bringing that up right now. Okay. And so my first slide is, is basically showing you the document, and, and I'm sure some of you might have seen that before, the Develop with Care program that was designed by the Ministry of Environment. And, and um, anyway, so that's my first slide. I am, um, so this, wor this working group of um, the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Ops and the Ministry of en Environment produce a document titled Environmental Guidelines for Urban and Rural Development, which was prepared for use by local governments, developers, landowners, and environmental organizations. One of the most, per so yeah, there it is. And so this next slide shows like one of the most pertinent chapters of the document in relation to my presentation today, which is section four, environmentally valuable resources. So you can just leave it on that slide for a moment. Thank you. Sorry, Lisa, we're not seeing the slides. Got it. Okay. So the importance of preliminary site assessments of largely undeveloped lands is to help local governments and developers do the right thing by reducing their likelihood of non-compliance of legislation such as the BC Wildlife Act, the Migratory Bird Convention Act, and the Species at Risk Act. However, my focus today will be primarily on songbird protection as there is currently few provisions for these species here in the Comox Valley other than the legislation I just mentioned. The reason I bring this to your attention today is that this issue of non-compliance with the BC Wildlife Act became so apparent to me during one of my morning walks adjacent to a property that was recently acquired by the town of Comox from the Comox Valley Regional District. Typically on my morning walks with binoculars in hand, I enjoy watching and listening for the many songbirds that nest in that area. Unfortunately, on this mid-June day, I was overwhelmed to see several acres of land stripped and grubbed of all vegetation during the height of the songbird breeding season. Many of the birds that nest in these shrubby areas that were previously logged but left to green up, nest on the ground, in stumps, and in shrubby vegetation. These are birds that you are likely familiar with, including juncos, towhees, sparrows, hummingbirds, wrens, and warblers, just to name a few. That day, based on my years of birding experience, I would modestly estimate that half a dozen or more active nests were destroyed during that land clearing each of which would have been in direct violation of the Wildlife Act and Migratory Bird Convention Act. If evidence could, would have been collected, the responsible party could have been fined thousands of dollars under legislation. So the next slide is actually out of order. I did put this together rather quickly, but the last few photos, if you wouldn't mind bringing up those photos towards the end, it's like, yeah, there we go. So those are nestlings, those are juncos. And I found this nest on um, an area, in an area that had been clear cut and allowed to green up for one to two years. And so if you go to the next slide, 
this is the uh, this is the location of this nest, and there's a kind of an arrow. I don't know if you can see it, but that's actually where that little nest was. It was just under vegetation and some like horse woody debris. So if I had not found that nest, it was likely that an excavator was going to be in there and destroying that nest. Luckily, I found it and was able to flag it and put a buffer around it, and this was on a road right away. So that was great. So in the next slide, this is a stump where there was a Pacific wren nesting and it had nestlings. And in this scenario, again, it was flagged, it was buffered, and the nestlings fledged in two weeks. So that was also another feel good story. So if you could just jump back to the previous slides, it would be great, thank you. So if you go to the next slide, so this, I'd like to stay on the slide. So this is the BC Wildlife Act, and it clearly states in section 34 that a person commits an offense if a person, except as provided by the regulation, possesses, takes, injures, molests, or destroys the nest of a bird when the nest is occupied by a bird or its egg. So that is the significant key. So only the nest is only protected if it's occupied. Two recent successful prosecutions related to nests occurred in 2020. One for a bald eagle nest that was cut down near Comox and one for a northern flicker nest cut down in Vancouver. Apparently, these contraventions resulted in fines of up to $10,000. And this is from Jenna Craig, um, senior bio at um, Flan Road. So large industries such as BC Hydro and LNG, municipalities and developers have avoided potential violations by retaining environmental consultants to conduct either preliminary site surveys or more specifically bird nest surveys during the breeding season prior to land clearing activities. Preliminary site surveys provide an inventory of the environmentally valuable resources on a property such as nesting habitat, wildlife habitat, wetlands, streams, and red and blue listed plant communities. In comparison, bird nest surveys are more specific and are intended to prevent occupied nests with eggs or nestlings from being destroyed and resulting in non-compliance. So the best way to avoid non-compliance with the BC Wildlife Act and Migratory Bird Convention Act is to avoid land clearing activities during the breeding season from approximately January 1st to August 31st to include many birds, such as songbirds, eagles, and herons. However, if land clearing cannot be avoided at this time, it is recommended that bird nest assessments be completed prior to land clearing. For songbirds, this equates to nest sweeps being completed in, potentially, in potential nesting habitat immediately prior to construction. The challenge is how to establish a system to protect nesting birds from land clearing when clearing land can occur without a permit. So in the next slide, this is an example from the city of Burnaby, I believe. Anyways, I can just continue on. It's basically a bulletin, which was to advise builders, contractors, and even homeowners that it was an offense to disturb or destroy an active nest. It may also be worthwhile, there's the bulletin. And so I know it's really small printing, but basically it was just to say to, um, to those different interest groups that it actually was illegal to destroy a nest. And also it may be worthwhile, you know, if you're doing it in a way that you're just trying to advise people, because most people aren't doing this on purpose. Most people just don't know they're there. And the only reason I keyed in to all of this was because I went for a walk one day and I saw this occurring. Otherwise, we kind of forget about it. So um, it may also be worthwhile to put something in the media, such as the newspaper or on the radio or on TV, just telling people that birds are nesting in their backyards, also nesting. Like, I'm not sure how you would approach developers on this, but bulletins might be a way to go for even when they come in to request a permit, 
to be able to provide them with some sort of bulletin, making them aware that, that this is an issue. Oh, um, a seasonal bylaw, possibly similar to that created for eagles and herons may also work on undeveloped and densely vegetated lands if they are at all monitored. Another option may be to request preliminary site assessments prior to rezoning applications or modifications to the official community plan, especially on larger undeveloped properties. Site assessments are more likely to help develop, help develop better contingency plans to protect environmentally, environmentally valuable resources. For example, the property near my house that I spoke of earlier also contains what appears to be a red listed community type described as an aspen crabapple swamp as described by the conservation data center. So in conclusion, the purpose of my talk today was bring, to bring this to your attention. I'm available to answer any questions you might have or provide further assistance. So that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Julie. I think we do have some questions. We're just going to bring up the participant list here so we can see. And it looks like Director Grieve has his hand up first. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Um, we've seen recently where the uh, forest behind Huban Road uh, had been logged this spring uh, quite unexpectedly and caused a major uproar in that school because uh, they had actually named some of the owls and whatnot that lived behind their school. Um, also, a few years back, uh, the about 45 acres on the corner of uh, Merville Road and Headquarters Road was logged in the same manner. In those days, Mage Birch was the uh, was the, the the head of the Mars organization and expressed great dismay at the number of songbirds that were probably destroyed in that that massive logging undertaking. Unfortunately, uh, as a regional district, we have absolutely no powers over this. Although it's been brought forward many times to the government to give us some powers over, uh, over uh, a tree cutting, we have nothing. Um, this maybe opens a door and uh, we can maybe argue the fact under, under the uh, uh, chapter 488 of the Wildlife Act, uh, it's on, uh, that's news to me. Um, but in electoral areas, uh, we do lack any levers of control and even less so uh, in uh, uh, agricultural land reserve areas. So, you know, my heart goes out to you. Uh, I, I understand totally and in total agreement, but uh, the government's talking out of both sides of their mouth as usual and don't give us the powers to actually do anything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Mooring. Hey, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I think it's always important to, to highlight these these concerns. I mean, we know that birds are um, really important to our ecosystem in terms of um, uh, insect control, but damages vegetation, et cetera, as well as um, being natural pollinators. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. It's kind of like with, with the importance of bees um, in many ways. Um, I know we do have some signage at parks, obviously during nesting season, um, Seal Bay comes to mind, Goose Spit and Comox, et cetera, lots of kind of beach areas. Um, so, I mean, maybe it's something to look at, obviously when we're doing new signage, such as up by the water treatment plant or whatever to, um, to just incorporate some of these educational, um, you know, points um, so that when people do, you know, people are visiting our parks and trails and they're, they're planning a, you know, a new build or, or whatever's happening that they, that they see the connections that, um, that are, um, that our birds have to, you know, uh, much beyond just uh, being pretty or sounding nice that there's they have a really important role to play in our ecosystem and um, and also food production all kinds of things so thanks so much for the presentation hopefully we can come up with some ideas to um, to highlight this this issue a little bit more thanks if I can I just like to make a comment on that is that is that all right Go ahead. Yeah. yeah thank you very much um, I think that 
um, my purpose wasn't to sort of bring out residential property owners or more parks and things like that, because really that's kind of like a drop in the bucket as to um, the issues that birds faced. Because realistically, birds are very committed to their young and their eggs and their nest. And so a small disturbance isn't going to throw them off. It's not going to keep them away from their young with the exception of some birds you know, no, no two people are the same, no two birds are the same. So they're all gonna react differently. It's more that when you have large scale clearing, that is when the most damage is done. And I think it's more important to try to educate those people that are working in these areas and, and, and doing these types of development. I, again, I don't think they necessarily know. Um, I don't think it's in the forefront of an excavator operator when he's working his excavator that he's mowing over nests. I actually spoke with one gentleman and I asked him, have you done a nest sweep? And he looked at me blank and I'm like, you do realize that, you know, May, June and July are at the height of the breeding season. Now, the, the window I gave you was very general because no biologist will tell you exactly when birds are breeding because then they put their neck out on a, on a chopping block. But what I'm saying is that there is an, a time of year that is that is the most um, prolific, right? The most when the most breeding is happening, and when birds are sitting on on egg on eggs and and nestlings. And I'm sure that that excavator oper operator did not want to run over nestlings. So it's just letting people get bringing out that awareness, you know. And and you know, so I think that's what I'm really aiming for here. Thank you. We, we do have a few more uh, Oh, Director Morin, were you? Oh, I was, I was just going to say, yeah, I think sort of throwing paint at the wall is a good approach as well, because those folks that are maybe at the parks do own companies that are clearing land and also have children who can be a good influence um, on helping them make some changes around that. So, but, but I, your point's well taken. Thank you. Director Grant. Thank you. Um, you mentioned when you first started about a piece of land in the town of Comox or that we purchased from the regional district. Or it was rezoned. It was I believe re it was rezoned. It was in, because when I asked about it, when I saw this happening, I did contact, I think it was a regional district first. And so we looked at the map and it looks as though it's now been absorbed into the town of Comox. And I am actually speaking to them as well. Um, on Thursday, I believe is their meeting. Tomorrow night, yeah. Yeah. Wednesday, yeah. No, I, I'm just, it, it's concerning because I don't recall us absorbing any regional district land in the last many years. And, oh, okay, you're and from I, the town of Comox? Yeah, and, and I'm just, I, I want to make sure we know what we're talking about here. Okay. Um, and, and you also mentioned an eagle tree near Comox as well. So, I mean, I know we're pretty um, stringent on eagle trees and what yeah. we do and we have all of that. So, I'm not sure, was that done by mistake or what happened? Oh, there? more than likely. It yeah. wasn't usually, it's usually not intended. No. Was it um, in the town though that that happened? Because I, I, yeah, again, I don't that's, recall that. I'm from communications with Jenna Craig because I just asked her, I asked her how you would approach um, with how, how you would go about dealing with a violation. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what would you do? Because like you said, you know, you see these things, but what, what are you actually supposed to do? Like, does the government have any teeth on these matters and so I asked what would you do and basically it would come down to you would need a conservation officer to come out and show evidence the nest was destroyed now I don't know how many conservation officers we have and whether or not they would come out for a bird nest but that's basically I guess the approach and so with that with my two examples that was um, on information from Jenna Craig from the ministry of forest lands and natural resources and urban land development, something like that. So, um, yeah, so I can't tell you the specific. Okay. I'm wondering if it may have been like, but this is, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if it was the one down by Anderton Farms area. Cause okay. I know there was a, a tree taken down there that had an, that had an eagle's nest in it. Okay, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm thinking that's probably not in our, in our town, but. Um, okay. But regardless, yeah, I mean, because we take it really seriously. Of that. course. And it's, uh, you know, it's a big deal. And, and, yeah. and uh, 
Yeah, just I want to I want to be sure because if there's something we're doing that we could be doing differently or better, then we'd like to know that. Yeah, but if and it's I not like within our boundaries, are, the board the borders are a bit gray in in that general mm -hmm. area, and even where we are, because things are getting absorbed and 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 um, there's different zoning now than there used to be. Like basically where I live, some of the we're kind of in the donut hole, and we're getting kind of surrounded by the town of Comox. I'm in the regional district. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll see you tomorrow anyway. So. Perfect. We'll You're going to get to hear it all yeah, over Excellent. Again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, at the City of Courtney, um, we uh, have uh, some resolutions on the books that uh, speak to um, uh, developers working with um, stream keepers and other conservation organizations um, in the early stages of projects. and. Um, I'm wondering if it might be useful for you to connect with the Comox Valley Conservation Strategy to make sure that um, mm -hmm. considerations for uh, nesting birds are, are on the table. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering um, what we have as far as it, you're talking about sort of large scale um, land clearing that would probably require a development permit. Um, so I was wondering if maybe Alana could talk about what sort of environmental regulations we do have um, that would uh, coincide with the development permit um, as far as uh, uh, a site evaluation and Thank you, Chair Kettler, uh, through the chair to the directors. So in the rural areas, we do have a development permit area for the protection of great blue heron and eagle nests, uh, not for songbirds. The trigger for that development permit is any type of land alteration, which would include tree clearing, any kind of site alteration, um, but it is limited to those two species. Okay. And then um, as Director Breve mentioned earlier, few limitations on what a regional district can do as an authority outside of the development permit authority. That would be our key municipalities, as you know, have some other powers around tree clearing. Thank you. Are there any further questions? So at that stage, they're coming in for their development permit. Would it be at that point that they could be notified of and provided with a bulletin on um, the legislation, such as the BC Wildlife Act. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, well, we'll definitely consider that. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you, you again so much. Thanks very much. Okay, we're on to reports. And the first one is the Comox Valley Transit Management and Advisory Committee minutes from June 18th. I'm overseas. Second. Thank you. Is there anyone opposed to receipt of the minutes? Sure. Yep, Director. Cole I, I, I'm not opposed to the receipt of the minutes. I just wanted to note something which I thought was uh, really positive in the minutes. It was uh, just in relation to the, I'm just trying to find the right tab. Um, that uh, in anticipation of the, the work being conducted on the Fifth Street Bridge, I believe there were 3,000 hours of additional service being considered. And uh, that struck me as um, something, anyway, a really positive sign and something I'll, something I'll bring back to people in Courtney when they talk about what the options are to deal with traffic. It's great to hear that people are, it's being thought through this early in, in the process. So thanks to Mike and everyone else at that meeting. Yeah, and we'll have an uh, opportunity to talk more about transit in the next item. Um, so seeing and hearing no opposition to receipt, that's carried. And we're on to item two, the COVID response and renewal for transit service function 780. Move receipt. Second. Thank you. And we'll pass this over to Mike yeah. Zabarski. Thank you very much, Chair and uh, Directors. Uh, Mike Zabarski has a PowerPoint presentation, so we'll just wait a moment for uh, that to be available for you. 
This is the continuation of staff's response to the board's request for us to review each of our, of our services uh, to honor and respect the principles that you've adopted with respect to your, your renewal plan to bring forward ideas for you to consider in your strategic planning session in September that would be adopted as your response. Transit is challenging and uh, Mike will present to you the status of things as they are at this time, as well as some options for further consideration and also update you on the transit, um, um, transit planning process. Thank you through the uh, CEO and the chair of the board. Um, so we've got a presentation lined up here to go over the um, transit core service renewal and um, response plan for COVID-19. Uh, we're gonna touch on the 2020 kind of financial picture, like where we're at today because of COVID financially. Uh, we'll look a little bit into the future over the five-year uh, plan. And then we'll also talk about the transit future action plan briefly and how the board will be involved with that. Do I have a remote for advancing? Okay. I don't have a laser either, eh? Okay, so this slide you've seen before, um, and it kind of summarizes the partnership and the annual cycle that we go through with BC Transit to uh, consider service expansions, provide direction to BC Transit on, on what we want uh, to see in the coming years uh, for transit service improvements. Um, this is obviously from a typical year, and this is not a typical year. so. One of the big changes with this cycle this year because of COVID-19 is that the transit improvement program or TIPS as we call it has been delayed. Uh, we were initially hoping to bring that to the board in July and, and have been told by BC Transit that that needs to be pushed further into uh, September and possibly even October. Uh, they're really focused right now on, on looking at the cost mitigation strategies and incorporating those into our annual agreement our, our annual operating agreement with them, uh, which we do expect in September. So if we could advance to the next slide, please. So where we're at today, um, during basically May, or sorry, April and May, and a little bit of March, we did not have fair collection. And, and as a result of that, uh, we're looking at losses of $179,000 in bus fare revenue. Um, and then we're expecting that to continue. So right now we have uh, reduced ridership compared to normal. Uh, last year was a really good year for ridership. We were at 750,000 rides per year, which was up about 11% compared to the previous year. Uh, during the peak of COVID-19, we were down 60% compared to that previous year. And right now we're sitting at about a 30% reduction. Um, so where we go from, from here with uh, ridership is a little bit uncertain. We don't know what the status of, of a second wave would be or whether the schools will be in, in full session. Um, and obviously it's that ridership that brings in that revenue. So we are forecasting that uh, through the rest of the year, we would continue to have decreased revenues from bus fare ridership. Uh, an initial estimate of four to $500,000 is, is what we've come up with by the year end for a potential shortfall. Um, and as I mentioned, BC Transit are, are working on a number of uh, cost saving strategies. Um, for example, they've given us a bit of a holiday on our lease fees on the buses for six months. So that's a fairly significant cost savings. Uh, we have deferred the 2020 um, service expansions that has saved us some money this year. Uh, the exact number that we're going to save is something that will be incorporated into the annual operating agreement, which we, wish we will get in September. Um, some of the other discussions are around senior government uh, financial assistance. So whether that's at a provincial level or, or a financial level, uh, those discussions are still ongoing and we're hoping to hear about those in, in the fall. And at that point, we would probably be in a much better position to make decisions at this level on any further service cuts that we might need to incorporate to save money or whether we need to use reserve funds that we have uh, to offset that, uh, that loss of revenue. Next slide, please. 
Um, so like I mentioned in, in the fall is when we'll need to make those decisions on, on service levels. Um, in the financial plan currently, we have a, a number of service expansions over the five years based on the approvals that were made uh, last year through the TIPS process. So we have 4,500 hours of conventional transit service uh, of which about 3,000 would help with the, the Fifth Street Bridge project uh, initially. Um, and we also have 1,200 hours of um, paratransit or handy dart service expansions over those, uh, over those years. Uh, and this table here shows the costs associated with that as well as the bus fare revenue that we would receive from that. And that net cost in the middle there that's highlighted, um, that kind of represents a potential cost savings opportunity to the board. So should the board be interested in, in deferring those expansions, um, that net cost row is essentially what the savings would be. Um, and we have already, like I said, res received the benefit of, of some of these uh, deferrals. So the 2020 expansions being, being deferred till next year will save us about a net of $60,000, which, uh, which was part of that $470,000 of, of mitigation measures that we mentioned in a previous slide there. And during this uh, five-year plan, uh, we show the tax rate and the requisition there. And just to provide some uh, understanding of what that equates to for an average home uh, valued at $500,000, the tax rate uh, slides from $60 to $79 over this uh, five-year financial plan uh, to pay for those expansions and, and the existing service levels. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So in the fall, basically what we've kind of boiled it down to is, is that the board has three, three directions that um, we, can, we can proceed with. Um, we're recommending at a staff level to pursue option number one, which is to continue to implement the five-year plan, which has those expansions uh, in place. The other options are to defer those expansions and, and kind of keep the existing service level where it's at. Uh, and then obviously the, the other option would be to reduce service levels from where we're at today. And these latter two do provide the opportunity to uh, save a moderate amount of money, which could also then be redirected to other transit uh, projects that we are foreseeing, which inclu primarily include infrastructure at this point. So we have a study right now ongoing uh, to look at the transit exchanges and transit priority measures that are required in, in the transit system. Moving forward, uh, that should be complete by um, March of next year, uh, and we'll have a better picture of what these things cost. But uh, I mean, obviously, their infrastructure they're going to they're going to cost uh, a little bit of money, and some of the savings could be applied to those uh, infrastructure projects moving forward. Um, this infrastructure study is, is being done in collaboration with our member municipalities uh, and MOTI as a lot of the, the infrastructure would sit within those, those jurisdictions. Um, one of the ones uh, that I'm kind of most keen on is the transit priority measures. So these are things that would allow the bus to move through uh, traffic congestion quicker. And um, during the uh, peak of COVID, we, we were actually seeing the buses um, not just late, but quite a bit early compared to their regular schedule because of the lack of traffic congestion. And it just illustrated that um, there's, a, there's a fair amount of time that our buses spend just kind of going through congestion that, you know, if we could uh, move them through quicker, we, we would see a cost savings uh, over the long term associated with that more efficient trip time. Uh, next slide, please. So as mentioned, staff are recommending to continue with the planned expansions. Um, these expansions will help with the ridership recovery that we want to see. Uh, it would ultimately lead to an increase in, in ridership, um, which are necessary to achieve our, our transit mode share targets and our, some of our other targets that we have around climate action. Um, it would also assist with mitigating the, the impacts of the Fifth Street Bridge uh, rehabilitation project. Uh, and it maybe most importantly would offer residents an opportunity to reduce their household expenditures um, when compared to the private automobile. Um, public transit is a much more affordable way of, of moving around the community. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so and how we make 
these improvements and what we do with these service hours, if the board chooses to continue with these expansions, uh, would be guided by our Transit Future Action Plan. So this is the plan that is going to update the 2014 Transit Future Plan. Um, we had started this Transit Future Action Plan process early this year and had stakeholder engagement um, sessions and then obviously got uh, delayed with COVID-19. We are looking to get back on track for fall uh, this year um, with our public consultation process, which will look a little bit differently this year, of course. And after we do have the, the public consultation process, we'll be in a good position to come back to the board with the feedback from uh, the public consultation. We'll have developed some concepts for transit improvements and uh, and a, you know an approximate prioritization of those uh, service improvements for the board to uh, consider. Um, and then, of course, another key part of this transit future plan will be looking at how public transit integrates with some of the other modes that uh, we have in the valley today, or wish to have in the valley in the future. Um, so we don't really talk about, for example, how does the bus network um, connect with transit or sorry, with cycling routes and is there proper bike shelters and those kinds of amenities at exchanges. Um, should the board be interested in kind of a more thorough or, or more, um, you know, strong approach to advancing some of these other mode shares. Um, that's probably something that would fit very well within the regional growth strategy service and I know Alana's here. Um, with a presentation later today to talk about that. So with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, Director Cole Hamilton, do you wanna start? Oh, I'll turn mine oh, off. Oh, sorry, uh, Director Frisch. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation, Mike. Um, maybe less, less of a question um, more of a comment. So I noticed in there that there was contemplation of cutting back on the, uh, was it the Denman or the Hornby uh, bus service? And also, um, I believe it was advertising. Was that, was that correct? Yeah, staff have identified a couple of other cost savings opportunities. We haven't included those in the, the $471,000 um, at this point. They're, they're available as an option and we'll have to kind of wait and see where revenue comes back to uh, over the next couple of months. And, and I think, you know, by then we'll have a better sense of where we're at and do we need to find those other savings or not? Sure. And I would, I would be hesitant to support something like that just because um, as you know, um, by providing service on Hornby and Denman to some extent, uh, you'll actually increase ridership on the parts that we do, uh, that we do the service for. Uh, the routes out to those islands and and uh, would actually increase our revenue so and the same goes for advertising and um, I think that's a really important part in Courtney right now uh, our council is supporting infill development intensification in a big way and uh, we also often support um, lower parking requirements for our developments and what this means basically is that uh, we're trying to get people out of their cars and into other modes of transportation so this transit service is a huge part of that. If the transit service doesn't grow and become efficient, then we can't continue doing this work because we can't tell people that uh, they'll just have to get around town if, if, there's, no, if there's no other alternative. Um, and one of the big reasons we're doing that is because we see the, obviously the huge cost of our roadways to maintain and expand. And right now we have a master transportation plan. I'm sure I've said it before that uh, highlights $90 million worth of car infrastructure. And we have no idea where that money would come from. So those are just modest improvements to moving uh, private vehicles around. And I imagine um, if, if we don't get on board with uh, transit, it, it could be much bigger numbers to keep traffic moving. So uh, I appreciate the work that you guys are doing on transit. And I hope we can, um, you know, with a few setbacks, we can continue on the same path. Thanks. Director Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the report, Mike. Much appreciated. Well, uh, one of the things you mentioned was sort of the shape of uh, school and how that's going to look in the fall. And uh, I have two kids who go to high school on the other side of the river. They both have bus passes. I've got a whole bunch on my fridge for April, May, and June, which we never used. But um, and I know that plans at this point, and it's always very, very much subject to change this year, is that for high schools, it's going to be two days a week of in-person attendance. So I guess I'm, I'm thinking there, it's a, it's a, 
um, it would be great to have as much integration as possible. I'm sure you're working on this with SD71 so you can try to track as much. Like for example, if my kids continue using uh, the bus every time they go to school, like they did, you know, they're only gonna take the bus 40% as much as they did because there's only two days of school rather than five. And is there, are you getting clear, clear indications from SD71 as to what's likely to happen? So you can start modeling just route changes and capacity given the reduced number of uh, in-person school days? We've had discussions with the school. I think there, there's various scenarios that they're kind of looking at and, and we're trying to hone in on the most likely, but it's a little bit of a crystal ball. Um, and as far as transit kind of modeling and, and looking at the different ways that we can modify the system at the, at this point, the, the only modifications would be to um, either go back up to full service levels for September, which is a recommendation here. And that allows kind of the greatest flexibility for what schools might do, uh, or it would be to continue with the existing summer service levels, which really just takes away some of those school specific trips, um, or I guess potentially, you know, further service cuts beyond that. Um, the existing schedule would make it a, a little bit more difficult to travel to school, but not terribly difficult, um, especially if it's only a couple of days a week for some of the students. Um, obviously, we, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible for the students to get around, and, and so that's why we've recommended the full service levels. Um, but we will definitely work more with the school district to try and understand those those schedule changes that they're considering. Okay, and then obviously, even if students aren't going to school, many of them are still gonna be doing something with those days of the week when and have needs to uh, to move around. But I, I can certainly see the arguments in favor of maintaining the, uh, or the increased levels of service. And I've also noted that uh, the hours we're talking about in relation to the Fifth Street Bridge project, that was all within the increased um, service level bundle. And that's gonna be particularly important to, uh, to operations here in Courtney. So I echo a lot of what uh, Director Frisch said in terms of reasons why we should, although it's challenging, try to continue with the uh, increased service levels. So I'd support that. Thanks. Next is Director Arbor. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think my comments will be a slightly different or substantially different tack on, on the issues facing us. I think you guys will recall I did vote against the, but the transit budget last time. I think we're facing um, structural fairness issues in regards to how the service benefits various participants, and that hasn't gone away and is only getting worse with uh, the deficits we're creating in a way because the system is not growing. And I also think that uh, COVID is, a, is, is not a, a temporary thing that's going to affect ridership. Um, I think when we're talking about being, you know, the, the kind of, uh, single figures mode share that we're looking at. And I, I know a lot of people, they do prefer to be in their cars right now, just to be safe in, in, in health. Um, I don't think we're going to see massive growth in, uh, in mode share. Um, so I, I really favor option two and three to, to either reduce service or maintain it at current levels. Um, I think we should pivot in terms of our climate plans and think about the 70% uh, or 80% of mode share, which is cars. And I think in, in rural areas like ours will continue to be cars, even if, uh, especially in this new era. And we know that the province has a 2040 strategy around um, electrification um, and moving away from fossil fuel and, and we barely spend any time at this board talking about how we can support the province in that goal in terms of the cars not in terms of trying to to match you know to, to increase um, a, a transit system that I think is is just not going to cut it is not going to make the kind of impact That we need to see. I'm looking at the proposed five-year financial plan with an increase of seven hundred six seven hundred thousand bucks, and uh, annually 
benefits we will see from it. I mean, in, in other files, we spend hours and hours talking about those kinds of numbers. Um, if you think about our economic development society uh, talks, I, I'm not prepared to support uh, such an increase. I, I know I was two years ago um, before COVID, before I better understood the structural challenges. So yeah, so I, I realize I may be in a minority here, but I, I will not be able, I, I, I just today, I, I would much prefer to see options that see us either maintain uh, our current level or make adjustment downwards and then displace the money that was gonna put, that was gonna enhance the service into efforts that will help electrification of, uh, of single passenger cars uh, and, and biking and, and walking. Um, and then as the last thing I would say is um, yesterday I did put in a request as part of UBCM to try to meet with the Minister of Transportation. I, I, I understand I have to go through the CVRD and through our chair and all that before um, that's a formalized request. But I also uh, like to report that there is a out of Nanaimo district uh, through VICC, there is a group around uh, creating a Vancouver Island transportation plan uh, that is emerging and I think our district's going to be approached pretty soon to appoint a member or something like that and uh, and I I, um, I think there's a lot of things that that we need to look at for the next 50 years and in terms of the silos that exist the inability of BC ferries um, of uh, BC transit of uh, the Allen corridor foundation of our airports to have a better road map as to where we're heading um, and I, I think that that's something that um, would benefit the whole island. I think when people make a decision to buy a car, um, they often buy a car because they need the car to go to Nanaimo, right? And, and, and they don't trust that the options to get there and all these different things. So it's all, I think there's a need for better, a better integrated plan like they're trying to do on the south part of the island, but just for the rest of the island as well. So anyways, I, I'm kind of starting to ramble a little bit, but... Uh, I've been spending quite a bit of the time on this report, and, and for me, I'm really pivoting in, in the sense that uh, I don't see how at a time of declining ridership and, uh, and, and, and cost, uh, proposed cost increases that, that we're going to move the dial in the next few years with this plan. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have Director Amir next. Thank you, Chair. Um, that's a lot for, for me to digest, um, Director Arbor. So I'm gonna think about that. Um, but in the meantime, <clears throat> a couple of questions to staff regarding um, advertising and um, COVID. Um, can I ask what, uh, what we're requiring of riders? Are we asking that riders mask when they enter um, buses? And are we advertising what our cleaning schedules are? Like, what are we doing to kind of increase confidence in ridership? Yeah, good question. BC Transit at this point is the only one doing any marketing or advertising of uh, the transit um, COVID response. Um, we've held our our funds kind of on hold just to see where the board was at with, co with cost savings. So we haven't spent any of our money, but they are advertising. Um, I have newspaper ads, radio, uh, on the bus, obviously, and um, they have recommended the use of face coverings, not required uh, them, and then they are also touching on some of the other points, such as the, the cleaning procedures, uh, hand hygiene uh, tips, and the physical distancing requirements. So, I mean, I don't know how extensive of a marketing campaign they have, but I definitely have seen a fair amount of of communication going out around that recently, especially. Okay, so we're not doing anything on top of what BC Transit's already doing, like that's more specific to the Comox Valley? Um, I shouldn't say we didn't spend any of our money. We did have our, our transit outreach coordinator um, out at the bus exchanges when we resumed fare collection on June 1st. We had them out there for a couple of days just reminding people about the rules. Uh, so we did do a little bit additional, but a very small amount of uh, spending. Okay. Um, so one thing that I didn't see in the report, and maybe it's just still too far um, in the future, is any type of um, action or movement around um, uh, ride shares. Um, I, I agree with um, Director Arbor that I think a lot of um, there, 
there's been a loss of um, sort of the safety aspect of using uh, public transit with big buses. But has there been any kind of movement on um, rideshare, like a publicly owned rideshare for small communities like us where, you know, Uber and Lyft wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily come? Um, has there been any talk in that, in that direction to enable, again, people being feeling a bit safer in a single car, but um, you know, needing to make certain trips? Uh, I have not seen anything from BC Transit uh, specifically on on rideshare. Um, they have been very focused on public transit as their their mode, and I know that that might fit within our discussion later on as part of the regional growth strategy. But at this point, BC Transit has not been um, directed to pursue any kind of mode uh, ride hailing or ride sharing opportunities. Okay, thank you. Director Moore. Great, thank you, Chair. And thanks, Mike, for the presentation. Um, I know that it's probably hard to do any kind of analysis on what um, what sort of the, the ridership has looked like during COVID in terms of whether it's, you know, NIC students who have dropped off or, um, you know, seniors or obviously regular um, high school students or whatever. Um, I would suspect as um, I know NIC did have in class uh, participation, et cetera. So I guess I'm wondering if there's, you know, if there's been any um, thought as to uh, what ridership is, is still there, like what is the potential um, with, with the increase? And then I guess also looking at what Director Hamir said about um, if we were to require mass, um, we would we would be able to have more riders, according to Dr. Henry. <laughs> um, and then the last thing, just in terms of our staff, our or um, the drivers, et cetera, um, if you've got any information on how they've how they've done during COVID in terms of um, managing passengers with those distancing, or has it has there been any um, you know, complications or, or big challenges for, um, for, I guess, uh, maintaining those requirements during COVID. Yeah, so uh, just on the first point about kind of who has stopped riding or who is riding again, I was just hoping, Lisa, if you could bring up the staff report. Um, page eight has a image which shows kind of who rides Comox Valley Transit. Um, it, it's a very interesting um, image and it was uh, done in a survey just before COVID and it shows that the Comox system as compared to other communities um, has a lot of, uh, I guess ha doesn't have a lot of work related transit trips. So a, lo a lot of our trips are taken uh, to school for shopping for social. We're not as heavily dependent on people going to work and back on transit. Um, which may explain why our ridership didn't drop as low as a lot of the other systems in BC, because ours was not affected by workplaces shutting down uh, as much. Um, so who, who has continued to ride uh, transit during, during the COVID uh, crisis is, is probably a very, you know, very much just everybody that was riding it before, other than maybe the people that are going to work and the college and the students. So a lot of people taking it for um, shopping, um, you know, whether it was essential shopping or not. Uh, I think those are the people that we, we, we definitely saw still riding transit. Uh, people that were essential workers, whether they were working at a grocery store or a hospital, were continuing to ride transit. Um, and, you know, people just kind of continuing to move around like some people do during these things. Um, it's really hard to know. We, we didn't survey people during COVID, but that is my, my guess at who was continuing to ride transit um, and who stopped would be primarily the, the schools and, and those people that were not essential workers. Um, as for advertising of, of kind of the requirements for masks, the decision by BC Transit was uh, to go with a recommendation. And I think one of the big reasons they did that is that it's very hard to enforce 
especially on a bus. On a ferry, it's a little bit different because you have many other people, ferry workers, kind of checking people along the way as they as they enter the ferry. But on a, on a bus, it's just the bus driver, and we really need them to focus on driving the bus and not, you know, enforcing whether people are wearing masks or, or not. And nor do we want passengers to be kind of trying to enforce that uh, upon other passengers. Uh, so it was more of a safety, kind of an operational decision that BC Transit made to not require masks and only to recommend them. Um, but it is a good point that maybe promoting that a little bit, promoting the, the re recommendations around mask wearing or promoting some of the other, um, you know, cleaning procedures that are in place might attract uh, people back to the bus, gives them some trust in the, uh, in the transit service as being a um, safe place to be. So that, that next page there, Lisa, that's the one. Yeah, so this is just back to that graph. Um, might be a little bit hard to see now that I look at it on the screen, but uh, it, it shows that the uh, Comox um, ridership, um, and I'll just read it out. Actually, I can't even see it because I don't have a colored picture of it. <laughs> but trust me, it's, it's not mostly workers. It's mostly um, other modes. Oh, here we go. So 20% of the ride ridership was for work, 21% uh, college university, 10% was to the middle and high school. So those two together is 31% is student ridership uh, to schools. 27% um, uh, was shopping and, and errands. And that was the largest proportion of shopping and errands um, compared to all of those other communities, which included Kelowna, Victoria, Kamloops, Prince George, and Whistler. Um, 10% was social recreational enter entertainment, 11% medical dental, and 1% other, whatever that is. So um, that gives you a bit of an idea of who, who is riding transit. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um, you had one more question, I think, was about the drivers and how they're managing. Oh, yes, thank you. The challenges that I've heard from the operating company um, have been <laughs> Uh, the drivers are feeling very kind of looked after. They've got vinyl screens in place. Um, they were very appreciative of the procedures that were put in place uh, during COVID to, to clean the buses, to make sure people were uh, entering through the rear doors only. Um, in, and in our system, the crowding is not so much of an issue um, for the most part, like it is in some of the bigger uh, urban centers. So there's been small challenges, of course, but nothing, nothing significant. Thanks, Mike. And we have Director Grieve next. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, you and I both know that uh, you've done a fantastic job on this file. Um, there was a time when we were in the teeth of it with fierce opposition from some members of this board that would prefer to get in their car and drive somewhere. And I remember them saying that whenever I want to go somewhere, I'm just getting my car and drive it. I, we don't need a bus. So we've, we've done very well. But in the words of a very old, even older than me, folk singer named Bob Dylan, the times they are a change. I think Director Arbor brought it forward that we, we really have to take a good look at what's changing in the world today and not treat this crisis as just a passing fad. It's gonna be around for a while. Um, if, we're, if we're hemorrhaging half a million dollars, that's serious stuff. I think that, that we, we're gonna to have to make some pretty hard decisions and we're gonna to have to let go of a lot of our predetermined uh, worldviews and, and they're all admirable, but, you know, considering the circumstances, we have to reassess where we're going on this thing. Um, my only question is, um, I understand from uh, what you said previously that we're going to have to have the decision point here in September, in, in the fall. Is that correct? When is the, part, the point where we're going to have to make this hard decision, what we're going to do? Yeah, um, so what we're hearing from BC Transit at this point is that we will get the updated annual operating agreement in September, and that is where all of the cost mitigation measures will be 
basically firmed up and we'll know very clearly kind of how much uh, cost savings uh, we should expect from them. Um, we'll have a better sense obviously at that point too on, on ridership and where revenue may, may be at, uh, revenue recovery may be at. Uh, and then the transit improvement program will be coming after that. So October, hopefully, maybe November. And that's where the board will need to make a decision on whether there's an interest in service expansions, uh, whether we should maintain the existing levels or whether we should consider um, service reductions. Well, then we're going to have to defer to that point. Uh, I would say, though, that... Uh, you know, one size does not fit all in the valley. That the electoral areas that are paying in about 23% of the budget receive 7% of the service. So we're going to have to uh, pivot more towards the multimodal concept. I, I think that I see more people out on bikes than ever before. And uh, as they get used to that, that kind of uh, activity, it'll become more mainstream. So it, we're going to have to stop full stop and rethink this whole thing. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Director Grant. Thank you. Well, I know in our community, um, I live about a block away from a bus stop. I see the bus frequently. It's a big day when there's someone on it. Um, they run almost empty all the time. I know Director Swift lives across the street from one and she has the same basic counts as I do that they're just running almost empty all the time. The only time you ever see anyone on the one by my house is when it's kids going to school and we haven't seen that. And it kind of makes me wonder how we ever became the school bus system because really they took their budget and dumped it onto us and we've now taken it. So, um, but, but having said that, I kind of agree with Daniel in that, um, you know, when we're running buses and there's hardly anyone on them, it really doesn't seem right to me to be increasing and and doing that and, and to stick to either the level we've got or a decreased service level um, probably makes more sense. Um, I think it would be interesting to see later in the year when we have a little bit better um, look at uh, just exactly what the costs are and what's gonna go on. We'll know a little bit more about COVID and whether a second wave is coming. I know this might be a little tougher on Courtney because of the Fifth Street Bridge situation um, and so I think if we put this off and get a better, uh, a better feel for it later would probably be a better idea for me anyway, because um, we're just not seeing people taking our bus that often. I, I, I don't know if you concur or not, but. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I would be really interested in getting the information for Comox because um, I, I watch the bus go by my house about once every hour, and it's really unusual to see anybody on it. Now, they would be returning probably on that route, but I haven't seen anybody really waiting at the bus stops on Comox Avenue very often either. So I would be really curious about those numbers. I can see maybe it's a different situation in Courtney, and you know, there's greater density, there's more places to go. But um, without the people going back and forth to school and university, it's the buses are really empty. And it's I know it's a chicken and egg problem. You need to have the service um, to get people on the bus. But um, I'm just really concerned at, at the cost of this service. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that it's always been a problem with with transit that the buses themselves serve um, cities a lot better than they serve uh, rural areas and um, on the high traffic routes it it makes sense um, and you know you have um, frequent buses and then you have uh, increased ridership because of the frequent buses it seems like the demographic that we're missing is that working population who who choose to use their cars and that's often because um, you know, they're not going to make it to work on time. There isn't a, the frequency of, of uh, buses that they would need. Um, but I think it's really encouraging that, that uh, we have students uh, taking the bus system and, and um, having uh, 
uh, students be familiar with that system and comfortable with that system rather than um, using their own cars. And then as they um, do get into a work situation, hopefully, you know, we will have a, have a um, more robust system for them to rely on at that point. Um, I think there, there is options. We, we really do need to look at into the, the transit futures um, report and do some strategizing about uh, what we need uh, in the Comox Valley and island wide and looking at um, multimodal and uh, possibly uh, ride share. Um, so we do have some options in front of us. Um, one of the things I was going to ask Mike about though was if we did want to uh, decrease um, uh, what we're what we're currently um, providing. It seemed like when during COVID that there was an issue with um, union. So how how fast could we implement a decrease if we wanted to um, decrease or or increase for that matter um, the amount of uh, buses and and routes because uh, it seemed like during COVID that there was a big lag time in between uh, what we would like to do and what the union could accommodate yeah so part of it is definitely the the drivers are union and there needs to be a, pro, a process we, we go through to give notice uh, when there's layoffs involved not we but bc transit with our, our operating company uh, and from what we understand that's about six to eight weeks um, on paper probably less in, in reality um, the other part of it is just determining what the service cuts are and do, redoing the schedules and potentially, you know, re, route adjustments and the marketing that's required to go out to customers about those, those changes. And that can take a few to several weeks uh, for BC Transit Sand. So they're not quick. Um, we have been working with them to develop an, an option to reduce service by about, um, I think it was 15%. Uh, and that's what we're calling a Saturday plus level of service. So every day except for Sunday would be essentially the Saturday schedule with a couple extra trips added on in the early morning and a couple taken away in the middle of the day and in the evenings. Um, so that's almost ready to go. Um, I would imagine if, if the you know board made this decision to go to that reduced level, the Saturday plus, um, that it would be a mere few weeks uh, to implement that. Um, Anything else would be uh, probably a couple of months um, for anything else uh, for reductions. So it's not quick. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay, so we have a recommendation. Well, we have three. Um, oh, right. We'll receive a report. Is anyone opposed to receipt of the report? Hearing and seeing none, that carries. So we're on to recommendation one. Thank you. Second. And it's at the COVID-19 response and renewal plan from the Transit Corps Service as included with the staff report dated July 9th be received. And I'll go through the role for this recommendation. Director Arbor. Uh, sorry, just a second. I lost the, uh, the recommendation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In favor. Director Frick. In favor. In favor. Director Hillian. In favor. Director Grant. In favor. Director Grieve. In favor. Director Morin. In favor. Director Swift. In favor. Director Cole Hamilton. In favor. And that carries. Thank you. Second. And recommendation two is that the board write a letter to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure advocating for financial assistance to offset the fair revenue loss due to COVID-19 and to continue supporting transit improvements. Madam Chair, um, just a question to Mike. Um, might this ask or might this letter to BC Transit be broader than just the loss of fare revenue because that's only a minor portion of our overall expenses and would it be good just to um, maybe reference the, um, the potential um, um, 
deficit that we are faced because that then also gets at those other areas that we really want their help and assistance on leases, lease costs and those other things. Yeah, I think that would be appropriate to broaden the letter and look at work from those senior levels of government. So Madam Chair, I would suggest that this resolution refer to uh, offset uh, our potential for a deficit rather than just referring to the fair revenue loss. Okay, change the wording to um, fair deficit rather than revenue loss. Okay, can I get first and second for that? No, I'll move, I'll move that. Thank you. Um, Chair, I just had a comment. Um, just in relation to the, the Fifth Street uh, bridge piece, if that needs to come into the equation also in terms of offsetting. I mean, if the letter's going to the Minister of Transportation, I don't know, I'm just bringing it up as as another factor that's that's kind of influencing things. I think, Madam Chair, we may be able to address that at a later date as um, plans are better materialized with the City of Courtney as to what the options and the potential impact is. It's still a bit of a work in progress. And right. There, there, there could and still will be op opportunities for us to present that to the Minister at a later date when we may be better prepared. Great, that makes sense. Thank you. Director Arbor, you still have your hand up. Is that from earlier? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, thank you. Uh, just speaking to the resolution. Um, yeah, I'm not sure which way to vote on this one because, as I say, I think there's big conversations to be had with the Minister of Transportation, and and I, I would like. Right now, I've got something in going to the RD around a meeting with her to request a, a more comprehensive view as to what's happening to public transit, uh, transportation in light of COVID and the Vancouver Island scene. Um, I guess this doesn't negate the other ones, but I'm wondering if we should just, I don't have a process to have those discussions outside of this meeting. We don't have a process in the next couple of months before UBCM to really think about what voice we wanna bring forward to the minister. So this feels like a bit of, um, I mean, immediate concern, which is probably shared by all municipalities across Canada. I don't think this letter will be surprising or anything like that. Maybe it just adds a voice, but I think there's bigger discussions to have with, with the minister. So I would love it if almost, if we kicked it to the next meeting and for staff to consider the best approach with the Ministry of Transportation around the challenges and options we face. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll vote it down on that basis and uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you. Director Grief. Well, Madam Chair, I just wonder if we could make that uh, as part of the motion and further that uh, staff be directed to, uh, to uh, coordinate a meeting with the uh, minister at UBCM, et cetera, et cetera, something to that effect, which would um, I put this at the front, at front of the uh, of the class for Director Arbor, and and uh, we could have uh, you know make it part of the motion, or would it be uh, substantially different? I, I look to staff for direction on that. Thank you. Uh, maybe a subsequent uh, motion to direct staff to bring forward to the board a, uh, a game plan for a meeting with the minister at UBCM, and then we can look at the broader issues that may be on the table and present those options for you. So uh, carry forward with the resolution that you have now to get this on the table before the minister, but uh, at a subsequent meeting, confirm the uh, details of that meeting with the minister and make that request that the board, board have that meeting with the minister at UBCM as a subsequent resolution. Okay, any further comments or questions? Okay, I will go through the roll. Director Arbor. Uh, thank you, CAO. Yeah, I'll vote in, in favor on that basis. Director Frisch. In favor. Dr. Hamir. In favor. Dr. Hillian. In favor. Dr. Grant. Director Grieve. 
In favor. Director Morin. In favor. Director Swift. Director Cole Hamilton. And that's unanimous. Okay, so would you like to go ahead and make a motion, Director Arbor, to um, set up a meeting with the minister prior to UBCN? Yeah, thank you. And, and perhaps the motion is that uh, that staff brings back, uh, you know, options for an advocacy and a request for a meeting. But, but I think the request for a meeting has to go pretty soon. So maybe the motion should be that the request uh, for a meeting at UBCM with the minister be uh, forwarded and that staff brings back options for advocacy. Madam Chair, that works because you get the request in and then the details of the specifics you wish to talk about can be provided at a later date. So that, that will work. Thank you. I'll second that. Okay, any further discussion on that motion? Okay, Director Arbor. In favor. Director Krish. In favor. Director Hamir. In favor. Director Hillian. In favor. Director Grant. In favor. Director Grieve. In favor. Director Morin. In favor. Director Swift. In favor. And Director Cole Hamilton. In favor. Thank you. That carries and we're on to recommendation three. So I'd like to move that we maintain the present service levels and with a report coming back and I think uh, they said September as to any updates in the, in the uh, transit service. Okay, is there a second? Yeah. Any further comments or questions about the recommendation? Director Frisch? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, is this the final decision point for our service levels? I, I presume that if we're aiming for uh, September 2020, uh, we would have to make a decision now to um, stay on track with our increases. Is that correct? Yeah, any decisions uh, for our September implementation would need to be made now, but mm. we don't need to make those decisions. We could continue with existing service levels, the summer service at this point, if the board wanted to. Okay, thanks. Director Grieve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, due to the unusual circumstances we're facing right now and the fact that we are losing so much in the way of ridership, I, I would favor going to the Saturday model that was mentioned earlier on. So I will not be supporting this motion as it stands. I think uh, we're dithering. We have to act now. We have to be decisive. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Director Cole Hamilton? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to um, understand. So, uh, so I understand Mr. Zabarski saying that Director Grant's motion would allow them to continue planning for an increase in September and that it wouldn't change um, the existing direction. But Director Grant, you're seeking a an update later on in the summer slash early September, and we would make the decision on the service level at that point. Is that the intent of your motion? Or perhaps you could explain. Yeah, I think that's the intent of the motion pretty much. I mean, I was just listening during that and, and they said really the drop dead date for knowing and more information will be coming later in the year. And uh, so that's what I based that on. Okay, Director Grief, you have your hand up still. Was that from before? Thank you. Yes, no problem. Okay. Okay, seeing no further questions, I will except oh. except for mine. Go ahead, Director. Yes, yeah, so I'm still a little I'm still a little unclear. So the recommended um, motion was to aim for 100% levels in September. And then the second part of it was to continue to be directed to implement service level reductions on a temporary basis. And was that temporary basis between now and September? Is that what the original motion was for? So the original motion was uh, to give direction right now to increase service levels back to 100% by September. We're, we're at a slightly reduced level right now. And the second part of that is to 
um, continue. So actually, in in March, the board directed or authorized staff, I guess, to make service reductions based on the state of the pandemic. Um, so that we didn't need to come back to the board every time, um, trying to be nimble. Uh, so we're the second part of this recommendation is to continue authorizing staff to make those those reductions in consultation with BC Transit, uh, the health authorities, and based on where ridership is going, if it's plummeting, and the health authorities are recommending that we we kind of shut the service down. We can. So that's that just a, that's just in your back pocket if you need yeah. to make changes. Yeah. So we wouldn't actually do anything okay. uh, right now with that based on what we're seeing. And what do you understand the motion to say now? The one on the floor? Well, I wouldn't mind hearing the, the amended motion again, actually. It was to maintain present service levels with a report back. Wait, you're not on mic. Oh. oh, sorry. So it was to maintain um, present service levels with a report back. And I believe you said September, we were gonna have some updated stuff. So I put September in as to any dates, uh, any updates with transit service. So by maintaining current service levels, you're meaning the summer service level that we're at right now? Yes. Um, yeah, so we, we could, the board could make that, uh, that motion. We would not be able to move up to 100% by September, obviously. And then when more information is known, whether it be September or October, about where ridership is at, where revenue recovery is at, what are the cost savings opportunities that BC Transit has uh, provided? The board could make that decision um, to increase to 100% then or possibly to reduce. Um, so we, we could defer this to a later date. If I might follow up, Chair. Go ahead, Dr. Crush. Yeah, what kind of um, savings then might we be? Uh, I mean, obviously you're guessing here, but um, how much more expensive is it to do our full uh, service versus our summer schedule? I don't, I don't know if you have those numbers. Um, I don't have those numbers exactly, but a summer level of service is a 3% reduction from 100%. Um, and to give you some idea of what the savings could be, the Saturday plus service was 15% reduction from 100%, and that was $15,000 per month in savings. So a 3% reduction would be a couple thousand bucks a month in savings. What is the 3% reduction mainly to do with schools? It's, yeah, there's about, say, five to 10 trips per day that we've cut out right now on our summer service levels that are specifically um, targeted towards the school bell, the high school uh, bell schedule. So we've just taken out those school specific trips from the schedule right now. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I don't know if it makes a huge difference either way, to be honest, but um, I would I would hope that uh, moving forward, we do work with the schools to get some service back in for them as, as they need it. So I think the original recommendation is actually the better choice. I assume if you felt you only needed 99% levels, you would uh, let us know after September. Okay, thanks. Director Morin. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I guess I'm inclined to, to be more in favor of the original recommendation as well. We're, um, the province has moved to phase three, which is opening things up slightly. Um, I think uh, summer, despite schools being out, I think we do see some summer ridership. Um, and I, I think the original plan just makes better sense. Um, you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball, but what we are hearing from the health authorities is that the next wave probably isn't going to happen during the summer or even early fall. They're looking at probably a little bit later um, because it doesn't do as well. The virus doesn't do as well in warm weather either. So, and people are outside more and there's a whole bunch of other reasons. So I think we're kind of a little bit more in line with um, Kind of the the overall provincial COVID response, I think, with with the the recommendation that was was uh, put forward by staff. So, I unless you know somebody says something that um, changes my mind, I think I'll I'll be opposing um, the one on the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Director Moran. I'm just gonna ask staff to put up the um, recommendation put forward by Director Grant. 
so that we can see it. Is it up on your screen? Great. <laughs> okay. So I'll. Oh, I just have, oh, if I could just maybe suggest October to give us a bit more time to see where ridership. Um, and revenues are at in September and what, whether school, how school you know, comes back and we'll have our updated financial information from BC Transit in September as well. So that will, that could inform an October. That, that's um, fine. I decision. picked September because I thought you said, but October is fine. Yeah. Dr. Cole uh, Hamilton. Yeah. Thank you. I, I realized we're trying to, I mean, I, I, do, I do see a, I do see wisdom, but given how quickly things are changing and how we don't have a clear idea, like we're looking at that bar graph that showed a third of our riders are going to school of one sort or another. And given that we don't really know what that's going to look like, um, I see wisdom in, in waiting, uh, waiting a little, little longer until we have greater clarity and, and more information before making like any kind of long term decision as for whether we're going to increase all the same or decrease in the longer term. And I'm trying, which is causing me to think this resolution makes some sense. I, I just want to maybe if you could explain like what would be lost uh, between. But if we were to take this resolution rather than the um, the existing resolution in terms of in terms of uh, the ability to respond to um, the needs in September as they start to emerge over the course of the summer as as Nick and schools get back, uh, because if anyway, I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Yeah. So. Uh what we would lose by not going back up to 100% service uh, levels would be those school bell oriented trips of which there are only several a day, uh, but those are the ones that are heavily used by students. So it would be a little bit more difficult for students to get to school on the bus uh, if we use the exist the amended motion. Um, they could still do it, they might have to get there you know, a lot earlier or potentially later. Um, but it would it would definitely it really only impact school uh, kids and high school kids primarily in, in their ability to get to, to school. So they'd still be able to do it, but it would be a little bit harder and that might be the all they need to not use transit to get to school. And, and can I ask a follow up chair? Yes. Was was and am I correct that in Director Frisch's question that sort of the difference uh, in, in the, sort of the savings that we would receive by going with this resolution rather than the one in the uh, in the agenda uh, would be a matter of a couple of thousand dollars a month for a period of a couple of months and the downside, as you just explained, is that it would be um, more complex and less efficient for students. And I know my kids find it difficult enough to get from the side of the river to spell without being late uh, as it is. So it would decrease that level of functionality. I think just to uh, explain my thinking, I, I think given the fairly minimal savings overall as it affects our, all of our communities um, uh, in relation to the negative impact it would have upon upon students and in, in, in maintaining their you know sort of connection to transit and getting getting there by uh free of private cars i think uh anyway i i i do see merit to uh the original motion and while i completely understand 
Director Grant's motivation, I think I will not be uh, supporting his uh, motion. So thank you for allowing me the time to clarify my thoughts. Thank you. Oh, my turn. Director Grant. Sorry. Yeah, I guess so for me, I guess it was a uh, a question between this motion and the Saturday plus, which is the 15 percent. Um, I was never really considering the motion as written. Um, I think that, you know, just for our community with seeing so few people using the bus in a time when we need to be saving some money. And I think Edwin says it best when this is long term and the impacts we haven't even begun to feel yet. Um, so I was kind of torn between this and, and the other. So if this is defeated, I, I won't feel badly about it, but um, I would be more in favor of the Saturday plus with the 15% reduction then. Okay, any further comments or questions on the amended motion? Just to clarify, this is the motion. The other was a recommendation that never formulated a motion, right? A, lot, a number of you have referred to it as a motion, but it was just a recommendation. Okay, so I will go through the roll. Director Arbor. Uh, voting on Ken's motion. Uh, yeah, I think uh, no. Opposed? Okay. Correct. Director Fresh. Opposed. Okay, Director Hamir. Opposed. Director Hillian. <laughs> Director Grant. I'm for it. I have to be. <laughs> Director Grieve. Opposed. Director Moran. Opposed. <laughs> I'm in favor. Director Cole Hamilton. Opposed. And I'm also opposed. So it's defeated. Chair, I'd like to move recommendation number three. Second. You'd like to make it a motion? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to move that transit service levels return to 100% and so on and so forth as per the recommendation. Okay, any further comments or questions? All right, I'll go through the roll again. Director Arbor. <laughs> Director Arbor, are you there? Hi, sorry, my internet is acting up. Um, yeah, I'm in favor. Thank you, Director Fresh. Okay. Director Hamir. In favor. Director Hillian? In favor. Director Grant? Opposed. Dr. Grieve? Opposed. Director Morin? In favor. Director Swift? Opposed. Director Cole Hamilton? In favor. And I'm also in favor. So that's carried. Thank you. And we're on to item three, air quality update. Sorry, Madam Chair, just, oh. just one comment um, yep. on, on transit before we leave that. And a good, fulsome discussion tonight, and we're hearing um, a, a different views and different ideas. Just want to uh, bring the board back to the staff report, and there really are three options for us for the mid to long term. We're not deciding on that tonight. That is for later, later down the road. But we are hearing some directors feel concern about continuing to build the system and spend more. We're hearing other directors committed that we need to, need to advance transit and we need to move forward. Those discussions will happen with you further on as more information it comes forward. We haven't addressed that. So please, over the next couple of weeks and months, give due consideration to these various different options. And uh, if there's information that you want to help in that process of considering those options, we're there to support you. But nothing further needs to be addressed tonight, but just to let you know that the more mid to long-term options for you are still on the table. Thank you, Russell. So the air quality update, I think we had a first and second. I'll second oh. it. Okay, thank you. And I will pass it over to staff. Thank you very much. And uh, Brianne Labute is on the uh, on Zoom call tonight to make a presentation of this air quality update and to answer any of the questions of the board. 
Okay, hey, hi everybody. So through the chair to the directors, I'll be providing an update this evening on the creation of the Airshed Roundtable. As you may recall, there was a framework that was created in late 2019, and that was through a working group and the firm Shift Collaborative. And the framework that was established in, to figure out how we can start to tackle this grand issue of air quality was to have an air quality coordinator that was really gonna oversee the whole initiative a steering committee or kind of like a leadership group, and then a broader group of stakeholders, which would be the Airshed Roundtable, and then some smaller working groups if needed on specific issues. So we came back to the board in March of this year to request some resources in order to fund that role of the air quality coordinator. And that has been filled by Pinna Sustainability. We awarded them the contract in May. So since then, we've been busy establishing the what we're calling the steering committee. And the purpose of that steering committee is really to help advance the work and keep the work on track by setting priorities, identifying knowledge gaps, supporting strategic planning and acting as our champions of air quality management. The first meeting has already been held. It was in the middle of June and we had good representation from Courtney Cumberland, um, two provincial ministries, Island Health and also a professor from Bank for Island University. And um, the town of Comox has regretfully informed us that they don't have the capacity to participate at this time, but we will be inviting them to the broader airshed roundtable, which would meet less frequently. And the village of Cumberland staff has also indicated that it, it may be challenging to attend all the meetings, but they're going to try their best to stay involved. We expect this group will meet about eight to 12 times per year, and then they will also participate in the broader airshed roundtable. So the Airshed Roundtable is a much bigger group. The invite list is currently, you saw kind of the broader groups and organizations that would be invited, but when we started to actually name all the people, it would be approximately 40 people that would be invited. But of course, we don't expect all of those people to necessarily accept. And the purpose of and that group would be a wide range of people. It's anyone from government representatives to citizens groups to um, the private sector as well. So what their purpose would ultimately be similar to the steering committee, but a little bit more high level. So they would be focused on kind of sharing information, sharing ideas, helping support the steering committee. So giving feedback on documents they may be working on. Um, we only expect that, and then also sorry, communicating out to their organization. So we really have a good network of people there and then know about what this group is working on. So they'll meet about three to four times a year. So it's a lesser commitment and to encourage participation, especially on stakeholders that might be a little bit more far removed from the air quality issue, we'll offer two options to participate. So either an active member that attends those meetings each year or to someone who receives the information and can provide feedback through the air quality coordinators. So we're hoping that gets more people involved by offering some flexibility there. So the staff report did present to the board a suggested list of groups and organizations that would be on the round table. This list came from that shift framework that was developed last year, then with some input from the steering committee as well of who should be there. And then there was interest at the steering committee level, especially of also including some members of the general public. So what staff is suggesting is that would be um, up to six people just because the invite list is already quite long. And those would be, we refer to them as the general public because they wouldn't be affiliated with any groups that are already on the round table. They would just be citizens that maybe have an interest in air quality. And there would be, we're recommending that there be an application process for them to apply to be part of the round table. So should the board support the staff recommendation on the next step? So that's the invite list plus our process to recruit these six members of the public. Then the way people would find out about that is we have a new project page for the Airshed Roundtable. Unfortunately, it's not the staff report because it wasn't ready yet, but the, the web page, if you did want to look it up, it's our website. So comoxvalleyrd.ca slash Airshed Roundtable or you can look up Airshed Roundtable in our search bar and it will come up quickly. So that project page is live. And then should the board proceed tomorrow morning, we would do an update just with the application form, what people could expect if they were applying to be part of the round table and what evaluation criteria that we would use to, to evaluate the um, applications. And then what staff would do is bring a report to the next board meeting for board, the board to actually make those six appointments. And then in order to garner a little bit more attention, hopefully, about the, the posting, because it's unfortunate sometimes we do these things in the summer that lots of people are away, we were going to do a, a boosted Facebook ad. 
So that would reach out to people beyond just who likes the current um, Comox Valley page. And then also to run one ad in the Comox Valley record as well to direct people to the project page to let them know to, how to apply. So those were related to the two recommendations about getting that um, roundtable created. And then a little bit more just about what the plan is for the next three years. So I did include in the staff report, a high level project plan. And the main milestones really are the development and the implementation of an air shed protection strategy, and then also a robust evaluation framework. So we can be checking in repeatedly over the years about how we're doing it, because we expect this to be a long-term endeavor. The reason we've kind of scoped out the next three years is that's what our contract is with currently with Pinnace Sustainability. So we're just kind of looking at major milestones in that time, but we do expect that air quality and working on air quality issues is gonna be a long-term endeavor. So Pinnace Sustainability who's acting as the air quality coordinator. What they're currently working on is the state of the air memo. That's really gonna tell us the current research, summarize the current research that's been done in the Comox Valley. And then also what's been done to date, there's been a lot of kind of piecemeal things that have been done. They're really great, like bylaw changes. And we wanna make sure that we're starting this collaborative group. Everyone has a common understanding of what we're starting with. So that's what's in the works right now. It's more of kind of an internal background document, but there'll also be a one pager that's prepared for the public to, to also let them know where we're at. And we'll make it available on that project page on the website as well. So that's, that's really it for me, just a, an update about the structure that we're proceeding with and that we would like to get those invites out as soon as possible, because we are hoping that the Airshed Roundtable would be able to have their first inaugural meeting in um, mid-September. So I'm happy to answer any questions that the board has about the framework that's been developed or what the next steps are. Great, thanks so much, Brianne. We do have a question from Director Hillian. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Brianne, for the report. I'm totally fine with everything you said and the process going forward, but I think we also need uh, the capacity to take some uh, specific actions. Um, and so what I'm wondering is, um, what exactly is the capacity of um, the contractor? And I, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Um, I've been advised that there's a simple technology that we could uh, employ that's primarily used in Switzerland. And uh, it involves putting an attachment on a chimney that reduces wood smoke significantly. And um, I did uh, speak to staff about that about a year ago and was told, well, we got no capacity to research that. Do we have any capacity within this contract for somebody to to research something like that and find out, for example, how much it would cost us to, um, to, to put one of those devices in place. We've got a number of hotspots uh, where we're gonna get complaints as soon as wood burning starts about sp specific houses and bad burning practices. And I would like us to have the capacity somehow to go and approach those people and let them know that uh, we're looking into how we could help them improve their practices, either by the, wood, the rebate, uh, the improved technology or, or, or some new technology or whatever. Do we have any capacity to do that in the short term? Absolutely. Short term versus long term, that, that's something we can discuss, but certainly that would be the purpose of the airshed protection strategy. And in our steering committee meeting, we got asked a great question. Well, why don't we just hit the ground running right now and just start implementing some actions. And I guess our response to that and what we learned through the initial working group investigation is that the issue is quite complicated and it involves changing people's behaviors and it, it involves a lot of different opinions. So I think Dr. Charmaine N said it really well. She said, we wanna do this right and that might take a little bit longer. So these ideas will really manifest through the development of that airshed protection strategy. And in terms of timing, that would likely, the development of that would start in the spring of next year. And the reason for the structure, including potential working groups is that we could do a deep dive. So certain members of the round table might be really interested in this new technology for chimneys. They could form a kind of sub working group and really dive into that. And then in terms of the capacity of the contractor in their role as the air quality coordinator, they would be the author of that strategy. So they would be the one that's really pulling all the pieces and all the ideas and all the discussions that are happening at the steering committee and roundtable and putting it into an actual document. 
So that's how I think we'll see some of these different options represented. Okay, I, I appreciate that and the value of a long-term process and strategies are well thought out. But but the short answer is that we don't necessarily have any resources on the ground to directly approach people who have bad burning practices and, and advise them of options for change. Is that correct? Through the chair. So in conjunction with this airshed roundtable that we're getting off the ground, we are still running the wood smoke reduction program. So through that, we still have the rebates and we do get a little bit of funding through that grant um, to do some education every year. So of course, it's always more of an incentive instead of enforcement approach because we don't have the authority to enforce bad burning. But we do have some plans for this upcoming burning season through that to um, do some education, including we're going to make a new video and we're having to, of course, re-event. Usually we would go to more in-person ev events to tell people about the rebate program and how to burn smartly, but this year we're going to be moving to more virtual. So we will have some education that is occurring through that this burning season. But that wouldn't inv involve the capacity to have staff, whether through bylaw or otherwise, um, actually make direct approaches to people identified as having bad burning practices that are impacting their neighbor's health. I'd say that would likely be premature for this burning season before we get into the strategy development. And Madam Chair, just wanted to add that uh, speaks to the complexity of the issue too. There's no single agency able to respond. We will require um, cooperation of the resources of the municipalities, which ultimately uh, manage bylaw enforcement within their own jurisdictions. So, so uh, it is possible for individual communities to to uh, go down that that road, but uh, the collaborative will will require resources from from all the stakeholders to come forward and, and do it in a collaboration. And that's why also a long term approach to this with buy in from the various uh, participants in the process would be very important. Thank you, Director Hamir. Oops. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks, Brianne, for the report. I mean, I, I, I think it's an understatement to say that um, um, we've been waiting for this for a while for this process to get started. So I'm excited that it's it's starting. Um, and I fully understand the complexity of the, the issue. I mean, I've even posted on Facebook the fact that we were giving money away for people to convert their, their wood stoves. And the flurry of responses from all, all the way from we're not doing enough to, you know, I'm, I'm taking away people's rights to burn. Um, it just showed this sort of the complexity and, and the range of, 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 of opinions. And, you know, it really brings up, it seems to just trigger a lot of people in the, in the valley. Um, could you remind me what service that uh, this air, ta air table uh, airshed roundtable is under um, because as director um, Hillian mentioned I'm, I'm curious about how we're going to resource this as recommendations start coming out from the roundtable. Yeah absolutely through the chair to director of Mir. So this project is actioned under the RGS service so the okay. fact to hire the coordinator for the next three years were under that service and that's to be reviewed annually at budget time. In terms of implementation, there hasn't been anything budgeted for that yet because we don't know what those implementation measures necessarily will be, but certainly that's something that could be discussed in previous um, budgeting periods. And then also as part of our co contract with Pinna Sustainability, they are um, going to assist us with applying for any grant opportunities that come up. So we've got our pulse on that and often it's easier to get grants for implementation measures than it is for putting together round tables in various countries. So For sure. we will be hoping that there are some grants that will be applicable that will be able to supplement funds that would be potentially needed through the RGS service for implementation. Great. And as Thanks. Russell mentioned, this is very multi-jurisdictional. So we're not even just talking about the, you know, the municipalities and the service participants of the RGS, like it's the province, it's the health authorities. So it's a, a complex discussion when it comes to financing. Thank you. So I have just a quick question about um, how we're advertising the um, wood stove replacement program now. Um, in the report, it says that we've had quite a good uptake of um, applicants for that, um, whereas in previous years, I think it, it wasn't that great. So um, just wondering uh, where we're advertising right now with that program. Through the chair, to the chair. 
So right now we are advertising that rebate program just on our, we have a, a web page for it, which lots of people go to, and then through the retailers. So we have a coordinator that oversees that program and she is out on the ground once COVID settled down a little bit, letting all the retailers know. So I think a lot of people find out through that avenue. Um, the video that we're gonna be preparing would be ready sometime early September. And then we're planning some boosted Facebook posts around that. And those seem to reach quite a few people. Great, thanks very much. Okay, I think we're still on receipt. Uh, is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that passes. And there's a recommendation. Okay, Second. thank you. The recommendation is that the board receive the report as information and that the proposed Airshed Roundtable invite list and invite list and the pro process to recruit members of the general public included in the staff report dated July 9th be endorsed by the board. <laughs> Any comments or questions about the recommendation? Okay, I'll go through the list. Director Arbor. In favor. Director Frisch. In favor. Director Hamir. In favor. Director Hillian. In favor. Director Grant. In favor. Director Great. In favor. Thank you. Director Morin. In favor. Director Swift. Paul Hamilton. In favor. And that's unanimous. Okay. Oh, sorry. Part of that was, and finally, that staff be directed to send out invitations to the Airshed Roundtable. <laughs> Okay, so we're on to item four, final housing needs assessment for the regional report. Move receipt. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Directors. And Alana Mullaly is here to uh, provide this presentation and answer any of your questions. Thanks very much, Russell. Through the Chair to the Directors, I'm here to present you with our region-wide assessment of housing needs. This project has just recently wrapped up, as you know, and we we're doing a bit of a roadshow presenting each of the individual reports to the municipal councils. And then we um, presented yesterday to the electoral area directors. So this project was undertaken under the umbrella of the Regional Growth Strategy Service using grant funding uh, that was provided via UBCM. This project is not only about the completion of the reports that you are now seeing, but it is also about the process um, that we undertook working together to advance our regional growth strategy objectives and working strategically with some of our key community partners, namely the Coalition to End Homelessness and the Community Health Network. Through those partnerships, we were able to capture community voices in the work. Some of our most vulnerable residents um, folks with whom we wouldn't normally get an opportunity to engage. This has resulted in a very rich body of data. Part of the project um, is about how we manage this data, how we interpret it, how we understand it, how we use it going forward as we come to you with recommendations about policy and on development applications. So um, uh, pre-COVID, we were able to host a workshop with the staff project team to delve into the raw data um, and including the collection methodology that the consultants undertook. And this, I think, means that we'll be well positioned to update this work every five years, as is required by the Local Government Act. So on to the reports. Um, these reports show us what is happening in our community in respect to population, our economy, and housing. And it shows us who it is happening to. The reports, as I've said at each of the presentations, don't give us the how or the what, what next. Um, rather, they spark the conversation or they're intended to spark the conversation about how we address some of the gaps that we have in our upcoming work. And one project in particular that we'll talk a little bit more at this table about uh, later in your agenda is the poverty reduction strategy. So as I said, a wealth of data, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, broken down by each jurisdiction, as well as aggregated to provide us with an excellent picture of our regional housing needs. This is important uh, in particular for the Comox Valley because our housing market is wholly integrated, unlike some other regional districts might experience. We know that residents will move within our region for affordability, access to alternative housing types, and access to services. 
It also shows us that no one jurisdiction needs to be all things to all of our residents. So for example, it, it's perfectly appropriate that we um, see most of our primary rental stock occurring within the municipal areas. Um, the um, report also highlights, highlights some of the actions uh, that we might consider taking in some of our key game changing areas, such as transportation, which you've delved into a little bit tonight, um, as well as uh, areas such as food security. So in respect, I'm going to just go through now some of the, the key findings. So in respect to population, as you know, our population is aging. The highest rate of growth uh, within our community is within that 65 year plus age cohort. And this has increased over 2006. Our average household size is getting smaller. And Courtney is seeing the largest share of one person households. In Courtney, these households are primarily young professionals and students, whereas in the electoral areas, electoral A, for example, the highest uh, demographic of one person household are seniors. Our oldest household maintainers are in Comox and our youngest household maintainers are in Cumberland. So those are the folks that are responsible for um, earning the income to cover the uh, household's expenses. Our region is growing steadily, not rapidly, although it might feel quite differently to some of our citizens. Our population is projected to grow to about 70,875 people by 2025. And that's really just over 4,000 new people uh, between 2016 and 2025. Our growth is primarily occurring in the municipal areas, which is precisely what we want under the regional growth strategy. Put people where the services and the infrastructure are best designed to meet their needs. In respect to um, household income, it's important to talk about the median. And so that's what this report does. The median being the midpoint versus an average. So it eliminates those outliers at either end of the spectrum. The median income for all households in the region is $64,379 before tax. And broken down, this is a median of $73,674 for owner households and $38,394 for renter households. I'm not giving you these numbers expecting that you'll remember them. What I really wanna highlight for you is the disparity that we're seeing between household income between owner residents and uh, renter. Um, households. 15% of all of our households fall below the after tax low income measure. The low income measure is specific to Comox Valley based on our median income. This report finds that younger cohorts are having the greatest challenges in meeting their household needs. 10% of all of our households are living in core housing need, with affordability being the greatest challenge. You recall that core housing need is, is um, a measure of the affordability of, of your shelter, uh, the suitability, so relative to the number of people that are in your household, and then um, the condition of your housing. So here in the Comox Valley, even though we have some communities with aging housing stock, downtown Cumberland, downtown Courtney, uh, our issue across the board is affordability. So what does this mean in terms of our median income households? Um, a household that is earning the median income, that's just shy of that $65,000, should be able to afford a two bedroom unit, but they would not be able to afford to purchase a detached dwelling. And that's an important um, consideration because the majority of our housing stock, 93% is single detached dwellings. Um, <clears throat> So on to our housing stock. Uh, as I said, the majority is in single detached dwellings, which are intended to be owner occupied. So, so purpose built for owner um, occupancy. Our primary rental market in Courtney accounts for 73 and a half of the region's apartment stock. And given our, our size as a community, it's, it makes perfect sense that the, the bulk of that primary stock would be in Courtney. Our rental market, um, as you'll know from hearing from your constituents is very tight we're sitting at 1.3% and that's across the region. Um, that, that's derived from CMHC's uh, rental market survey. So that number doesn't pick up the secondary rental market, which we'll talk about in a moment. Those are our purpose-built primary rental units. 
and this is really low. A healthy vacancy rate would put us between three and five percent. This is a trend that we are, of course, seeing across Canada, but but this is a really important number for us. Um, and we we have less primary rental uh, in 2016 than we did in 2006. This doesn't account, I will comment, this doesn't account for the approximately 240 primary rental units that um, have been approved by the City of Courtney and should be coming online in the next one to two years. Uh, but it is an important um, uh, trend to keep in mind uh, and look to pr protecting our existing stock and creating opportunities for development of more primary re rental. Pardon me. The reason that I'm making this distinction is because um, 70% of our rental market, and we're talking market housing, is in the secondary um, market. So the difference is that these are things like secondary suites, carriage houses, um, the kinds of things that we don't really have much control uh, about whether or not people choose to make them available for rental. And these are the kind of units that can flow back and forth quite fluidly between owner occupancy and rental occupancy or in some cases, um, commercial uh, units, such as vacation, commercial vacation rental units. So um, the CMHC data puts our market rents at, at a pretty low rate. And again, that's primarily because they're focused on the primary rental market. So a better picture of where we are with rental household affordability uh, is to look at that secondary market. And we, we find that data through looking at things like Craigslist, Kijiji, et cetera. So a two week scan um, of that market early this spring showed us uh, having 82 listings in our region. Um, and I'll just start with, with the number of bachelor units. The average uh, five were available and the average rent was $999. Um, for a two bedroom unit, we were looking at an average of $1,392. And for a four plus bedroom of which there were only three, we were looking at an average rent of $2,450. So this, I think uh, I would suggest, is, is a clearer picture of the, the state of affairs for renter, renter households, rather than looking at that primary rental data that we get through CMHC. And of course, those are all significantly higher than, than what CMHC is tracking. And this um, factors uh, absolutely in line with what we heard through our qualitative uh, data collection uh, through surveys and through interviews and focus groups. This is what people are experiencing on the ground. We saw a pronounced increase in market rents in 2018 and 2019, and we certainly don't see any um, indication that that's going to slow down or change. As I said, the most significant type of core housing need in our region is affordability. Those that are in core housing need are primarily singles, followed by lone parents. Renters are far more likely, six times more likely, to be in core housing need than owner households. And renter households, as I've just described, have far fewer uh, alternatives uh, for dwelling type than owner households. Um, when we look at sale prices, again, we look at the median sale price, uh, and we see that for the first half of the last decade, um, our sale prices were pretty steady. Um, and then we saw a significant increase in the average or median sale price from 2016 onward. And again, we don't see a huge sign of that with a downturn. In fact, anecdotally, um, after COVID, we're starting, or this first wave of COVID, we're, we're hearing that uh, sale prices are actually increasing. Um, so we, we peaked in 2017, um, and this would be with the exception of condominium apartments. We did see a little bit of drop uh, in the last couple of years in those units. Overall, what we're seeing uh, since 2016 is, a, is an average of 28% year over year increase in sale prices. So essentially this tells us that it is getting harder and harder for uh, residents to buy a single detached dwelling in the Comox Valley. And those who would previously have been able to do this are being pushed out of our community. So some of the key takeaways that I'd like to leave with you, um, as I've painted, renter households are much more vulnerable in the region than owner households. Um, the preliminary findings of the 2020 point in time, uh, homeless count show an increase in visible homelessness since the last count in 2018. And our qualitative data shows an increase in hidden homelessness. And those are the folks who are couch surfing, doubling up, um, and those who are accessing housing support services. 
we're seeing a strong link between access to alternative modes of transportation and overall household affordability. A number of our respondents, survey respondents, indicated that connection, uh, that you know, the, their transportation costs significantly undermine their ability to um, access housing. So ultimately, we know that we need housing options that are going to meet the needs of those living on fixed incomes and prioritize housing uh, proposals that have universal de design principles embedded. So essentially, that's the principle of design for all ages and all abilities. Um, and that, of course, that principle transcends age. Uh, it makes generally for a more inclusive community. There is enough housing being um, constructed in our region to meet our projected population. but that housing isn't necessarily going to meet the needs of our residents in terms of um, our demographics. So the size of the homes are perhaps bigger than what our residents uh, actually require. And of course, in respect to affordability. And to date, uh, the private market has not been able to meet the needs of all residents. And so there is a need for us to explore and encourage uh, the development of more non-market housing options for residents. For our next steps, um, so specifically for this project, we'll wrap up the presentations of the individual reports this week with, with the last report going to Comox Council tomorrow. And then we're having um, an online community forum. This was originally hoped to be an in-person event. We've moved it to a Zoom platform. And just today, I've been able to confirm that our date will be August 12th. So you'll each receive an invitation, as will uh, the project team staff, to attend that via Zoom. And that's where our consultants will present the findings and there will be opportunity for uh, questions, answers, and, and discussion. On the mid, uh, mid scale or longer range scale, um, we'll be using these findings in the poverty reduction strategy work. And that project, as you know, uh, has a focus on children, youth, and families, social supports, and affordability, including transportation and food security. That strategy uh, will identify the specific game-changing areas where we can take actions um, in order to create benefits in other areas, such as transportation, food security, et cetera. The strategy will outline actions by each sector, so local government, nonprofit, senior government, et cetera, private sector, that will move the Comox Valley towards the provincial uh, poverty reduction target of 25% by 2024 and 50% for children by 2024. On the longer term, um, this board and the councils will be able to use these findings in your consideration of development applications that cross your table in setting policy and working with our community partners and certainly in advocacy work that you will be doing with senior level government. Thank you, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Alana, really good report. Uh, I think Director Hinier was first. Hi, thank you, and thanks, Alana. Um, it's always great to hear it a second time. We just had Alana present at electoral areas. Um, as you've mentioned, um, now that we have these findings, we can use that um, to sort of um, base decisions on um, when developers come forward. So we have recently had a developer come forward and um, basically um, showcase or, or at least state that the development proposed was going to be quote unquote affordable housing. Um, I'm wondering if you have in light of the, the, the outcomes of this report, um, and I know you were there for the presentation, if you have comments regarding the level of affordability of that specific um, presentation and any other comments that kind of um, have come to light since this report has been published. through the chair to the directors. Thank you, Director Hamir. I guess one thing I would say that when, when we're looking at development applications, that, that one and then, and then more generally, is to really look at that median income number that I talked about and the disparity that we see between owner households and renter households. Because I think that gives us a really clear picture of who we're talking about and the kind of need we're talking about. Um, so sometimes we'll see development proponents talk about averages in income and, and for a certain rate of affordability. And this study shows us that uh, that number is a little bit more nuanced. So I would suggest that would be one lens uh, that staff would be looking at a development application in the context of these findings. I think this report um, and its findings will serve not just, you know, uh, 
planners at the RD, but also your municipal planners in having those conversations with developers who are interested in helping the community to address some of our affordable housing challenges, either through partners with um, nonprofit uh, groups or, or providing, you know, through housing agreements, contributions, et cetera. Um, I think that's, uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I think as I say, it's really that disparity between the owner households and the renter households that it's, it's important to think about uh, overall affordability. For sure. And, you know, I think you've brought up a really good point, um, the difference between median income and, and average income, which I think the developer was using as well. And I, I, I quote, remember him quoting that based on a median or um, an average income of this, that a $400,000 house is, is considered affordable. And um, it, it didn't make sense to me at the time. And now I see why it's because he didn't use a, a median income instead. Okay, thank you. Director Grant. Thanks. So um, I'm wondering in these reports, do they ever look at why the price of housing is rising so quickly? I mean, I think it's at the root cause of 90% of this. And, you know, I remember back in the day in, in Comox in the mid 90s, we would have 200 building lots on the market at almost any given time. And we would sell 200 and it actually kept the prices fairly moderate. Um, I think over the last years, we've probably averaged two or three lots on the market in our community. And, you know, when you look at what's going on, we have one land developer being Crown Isle that's been the only one that brings a lot supply on the market. And for 10 plus years, they've been able to set the prices. And, you know, it, it seems to me that if we could get to the root cause of why it's rising, I think I know the answer already so quickly that perhaps we could look at a different way of dealing with some of this. Um, thank you, Director Grant. Through the chair to the directors, um, a couple of things strike me about that observation. Uh, I agree when you, when you have one developer bringing on all of your supply, they do get to set the pricing. This report doesn't necessarily look into um, why prices are increasing, but it does look at trends. So. Uh, one, I would say there is not a direct, uh, a direct line between supply and affordability. Uh, supply doesn't indicate affordability necessarily because what we've been supplying 93% of the time is single detached dwellings. So we have folks who, um, this, so I'll leave that at that. We've got majority of our stock is in single detached dwellings. And so um, it's not surprising that those folks who cannot afford a single detached dwelling still can't, even though we're bringing on more single detached dwelling options. Um, the other thing I would say is that the private market is really good at bringing uh, product that, uh, you know, for which there is demand. And so and where the development community is going to make a profit. And, and that's what they need to do. They need to make a profit. Um, so really what this study shows us is that the private market isn't able to address the needs of many folks in our community and perhaps never will be able to, to meet those needs. And so that's why we really need to look at increasing our stock of non-market options for uh, the demographic within our community who will never be able to afford a single detached dwelling in an owner occupancy scenario. Yeah, I guess, you know, when I look at projects that we've been dealing with lately, they're all infill projects, pretty much. Um, every one of them comes with great debate. You're lucky to get out of those public hearings with your hide uh, on the way out the door. It's amazing how people that know me well um, will tell me how we need more development, except when it's in their neighborhood, then they find a problem with it. Um, you, on top of that, put strata fees, uh, insurance problems. Uh, we have a building in Comox now with rain penetration and their, their condo fees are going up to six and $700 a month. It doesn't surprise me that people don't want to live in condos and that infill is really a secondary choice in our community. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I would disagree with you on the fact that um, supply of land doesn't help to mitigate the, the cost issues that, that are going up because at the root of every price, the, the sticks and the bricks and the mortar don't appreciate, but the land below it does. And that's what causes the prices to go up in my opinion anyway. 
and we just don't bring any supply on. If I may make one comment uh, through the chair to the directors, um, I think one thing that this study really pointed to for me was that we have a number of residents, primarily in that 65 plus age cohort, who I think it's fair to use the term are overhoused. So they are living often in those three bedroom single detached dwellings, and they don't need the space. And for some, through the study work, we're finding that maintenance is becoming harder and harder, which isn't surprising. As we age, we generally need less space as our household size shrinks. But one of the things that we do see in that is those folks have nowhere to go, not just because of affordability necessarily, but because of the stock and the kind of um, stock that is coming to market. So um, I would say that when you do increase the supply of singles, you, you maybe take the pressure off um, you know, some segments of the market, uh, but I don't think we're going to really see a real change and a movement of people out of those single detached dwellings, those, those larger homes, until we start seeing more smaller units coming onto the, onto the market. And then, like I said, it, it's really about the private market not being able to address all of our housing needs. Thanks, Alana. Director Frisch. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I was just going to point out um, just some quick calculations if we're expecting people to pay 30% of their wages towards housing and they're making, um, you know, let, I guess if they're in the bottom half of the median, uh, those renters would be looking at units for a single bedroom in the range of uh, six to $900. So um, they do come around and are developed occasionally, but to, they're very rare to be at the bottom end of that, more likely to be at the top and higher. So if anyone's listening, of course, you know, those $700 one bedrooms um, used to exist, but they no longer do. So if we can find a way to provide some of those, it would probably be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to um, using this information and uh, moving forward with the poverty reduction strategy. And I think that's really important to um, take that holistic view to look at housing, transportation, food security, uh, child care, look at the nexus of all those and, and really see where we can make the most difference. So um, I'm quite excited about that. Are there any further Comments or questions? I think we're on receipts still. Sorry, I had my hand up, Chair, a little while ago, but. Okay, go ahead, Director Moore. Yeah, I mean, actually, Alana pretty much must have been reading my mind because all the comments um, that, you, that she made were in line with what I was thinking. And that's that, you know, Courtney, as you mentioned, has had a lot of, um, a, a lot of even rental, um, development in the, in, in the, in the last little while and coming up, but, but unfortunately, you know, it's not really affordable. And when I think about professional, uh, single professionals or even professional couples who are making pretty good money and they can't afford the rent. So, I mean, we just have a real, just, I mean, I just don't see how even in, increasing the rental market the way it is right now is, is going to address the issue. And, I guess it makes me think of um, just those incentives for developers and how that's one aspect that we need to um, we need to come up with some creative ideas to um, you know to to help uh, you know even give a, a few breaks to developers who are who are um, really trying to to uh, narrow that gap a little bit. Um, and again, also in terms of mostly seniors who are living in those big homes, I mean, I've brought it up before, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I've met so many of those folks who, um, they, they don't want to be in those big empty houses, but they have nowhere to go. And, you know, those older homes that often are still in reasonable shape could, would be lower prices for younger families starting out. So I think that, um, Although the supply might be increasing, as Alana said, we, we just don't, people can't afford it, even if they are um, higher income households. So I'm hoping that we can come up with some creative ideas 
um, and in conjunction with that poverty reduction report. Thanks. Thanks, Director Morin. And Director Grieve, do you have a question? Just a quick comment um, for Wendy. Uh, please do not stop becoming a broken record. It's so important. I think a lot of those issues, everybody spoke so eloquently. Everybody had really good points. They're on opposite sides of the spectrum sometimes, but that's where it's at and we can bring it together. Uh, Alana, I just wanna thank you so much for your summation and uh, please convey our thanks to the, uh, the uh, consultants that did all this work because it's am amazing and, and, and tremendous. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me the latitude. Thanks, Director Gray. Okay, seeing no further comments or questions, is there anyone opposed to your seat? Okay, we, we're just talking about a video, um, but it is for the next item. Um, so that was carried on receipt. Uh, there is a Move the recommendation. Second. And the recommendation is that the regional housing needs assessment be received and posted to the Comox Valley Regional District website. And I'll go through the roll. Director Arbor? Yes. Director Frisch? In favor. Director Hamir? In favor. Dr. Hillian? In favor. Dr. Grant? In favor. Dr. Grieve? In favor. Dr. Morin? In favor. Dr. Swift? In favor. Dr. Cole Hamilton? In favor. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. And we're on to item five, which is the regional accessibility strategy update. Chair, uh, how would you feel about a comfort break at this point? <laughs> or soon? <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It's been two and a half hours, so uh, I think that uh, that's very appropriate. Thanks for the reminder. Um, how about we take five minutes and we'll come back to item five.
and there is a video. So, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> That's for the next item, the RGS. But we have that to look forward to. <laughs> okay, so uh, did we have a first and second for? Okay, so can I get that for the regional accessibility strategic move, move update? Second. Thank you, and I will pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Scott Smith is here to outline his report and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Directors. Um, just wanted to provide a quick update on some accessibility items that uh, have come before the regional district um, and update the, the board on, on where, we, where we are with some of them. So the CVRD did uh, receive some, some uh, specific feedback from the uh, Accessibility Committee in regards to our new office building that we're here. And I do want to uh, reiterate that the building was built to the Provincial Building Code and met all the accessibility standards, but we did invite them to attend and they did provide us some feedback on the building. We have made uh, several uh, changes that were relatively easy to accomplish. Letdowns coming out of uh, the side doors here, we relocated the uh, handicap uh, parking uh, stalls uh, at their suggestions. And so we have put those in place in the building. They did suggest some more complicated and expensive items for us to consider. And we will investigate those and bring those forward to the board uh, for consideration potentially in the 2021 uh, budget cycle. Uh, the board also did receive a letter from the city of Courtney to develop a regional accessibility strategy. Um, a portion of the poverty reduction strategy will consider accessibility from a broader social inclusion uh, perspective. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to that work. That's going to encompass a lot of a lot of avenues. Um, the Social Planning Council and the Accessibility Committee um, also have met and have a, a statement of intent where potentially the social planning uh, society would potentially provide the accessibility community uh, with some administrative structure and support. Uh, they would be potentially looking for some grant funding in that regard. Um, also around the regional accessibility strategy, um, that is uh, something that we would uh, suggest that the board potentially consider during their su September strategic planning session. And that if the board wishes, you know, social inclusion to be a strategic driver, we could then bring that for further consideration uh, again during your 2021 budget consideration, as well as the, the potential ask from the social planning council of, of uh, 15,000 to help support their activities, but also uh, the accessibility committee. And I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Great, thanks Scott. Are there any questions? No, is anyone opposed to receipt? Oh, sorry, there are questions. Director Morin. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say that I'm really happy with this development. First of all, thank you to staff for um, for meeting with the committee and um, making some adjustments and also exploring further what else could be done, which is just wonderful. Um, and I'm also happy to hear that there's some movement for the accessibility committee to be kind of folded into social planning and my understanding is and i probably director hamir and others may know that um, um uh, director grieve as well um, being on the social planning committee that there's movement to make accessibility um more interestingly more inclusive or broader in terms of what the definition of that is so beyond physical accessibility um you know, looking at um, all, all kinds of forms of, of accessibility needs um, 
broad, more broadly defined. And I see everyone's smiling and I didn't get naked um, on the break. So I don't know, maybe they're, I don't know what's going on. I'm not even on video. So anyway, everyone's just happy, I guess, after that last break. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just thrilled with uh, staff and the developments going forward with, um, with the accessibility needs. Thank you. We needed a little bit of uh, humor, didn't we? can't even see you at all, Director Morin, so that's that's probably a good thing after that we, comment. But we, um, we might need an editor. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Director Hamir. Uh, Director Morin just stole the thunder. That's uh, also what I wanted to talk about was um, just, uh, you know, the situation with the Accessibility Committee. I'm really pleased as well as um, with the work that staff has done to accommodate some of the recommendations that the um, the accessibility committee had with our building. Um, but apart from a plan, like a regional accessibility strategy, I'm wondering if there is another way that, um, that our staff could connect with the accessibility committee whenever we have um, changes to our public buildings um, events. So to ensure that accessibility is, is kind of embedded in all of our practices up in center and you know, realizing that yes, the building was built to code, but that the code is quite deficient in what the needs of our community are. Um, is there a way that staff can consider um, if you know, an upcoming event or, or, or I guess I'm asking for a more regular check-in with the sustainability committee so that upcoming things um, can be um, integrated rather than at the end coming as a surprise. I, I think what is proposed in the reports and the options uh, going forward will will provide that opportunity to better ingrain accessibility within the community through the poverty reduction strategy. It, it, it's the broader context of how we as 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 four local governments might respond. And um, in the strategic planning process of this board, definitely that's where you can set uh, the priorities and the lens that we apply to to all of our projects. So a good discussion then. To, to be had, I think, in, in how it, it, it becomes more a part of our, our business. But uh, having said that, um, any projects where, where we are contemplating a major piece of infrastructure and, uh, and the design, by all means, we, we can look at in, including them and their input in, in the early stages of design and planning. Okay, because I think, um, as Director Morin alluded to, um, the, the accessibility committee is hopefully going to be expanding its, its mandate of just not just physical accessibility. And while our, our pools are shut, for example, I know gender neutral washrooms is something that a number of, of my constituents have um, pointed out to me are a concern in terms of the ability of them feeling safe in um, some of our facilities. So I, I'm hoping the sooner that we can really integrate those concerns um, moving forward that we're, we're able to make take some action in, in, in that direction as well. Thanks. Thanks, Director Mayor. Any further comments, questions? And is anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing and hearing none, that's carried. And there's a recommendation. Move the recommendation. Second. Thank you. And the recommendation is that the Comox Valley Regional District consider a regional accessibility strategy and social inclusion as part of the board's strategic planning in September 2020. Any comments about the recommendation? Okay, I'll go through the list. Director Arbor? Yes. Director Frisch? In favor. Director Hamir? In favor. Director Hillian? In favor. Director Grant? In favor. Director Grieve? In favor. Director Morin? In favor. Director Swift? In favor. Director Cole Hamilton? In favor. Great, that's unanimous, thank you. And we're on to item six, COVID-19 response and renewal, the regional growth strategy. Move for seat, or second. Uh, I didn't get a second. Second. <laughs> thank you. I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you, Chair and Directors. And Alana Malayli is here to present the uh, Regional Growth Strategy and our Response and Renewal Framework in consideration of your principles. And I leave it to Alana to, pre to present the report and the recommendation. 
Thank you very much, Russell. Uh, through the chair to the directors. Um, COVID-19, as you know, has heightened the community's focus on a number of priority areas that are identified within our 2020-2021 RGS work plan. So we've talked about some of them tonight, air quality, affordable housing, transportation, food security, um, and poverty reduction. Uh, for many, the pandemic has contributed to a real sense of urgency around these issues, and uh, for others, to a sense that more needs to be done on these very complex multi-jurisdictional issues, and that we need to accelerate our actions. Um, so to that end, staff is continuing to work hard to deliver each of these projects to you. Although the um, majority of the projects uh, within the RGS service fall within that functional task category that, that um, you set earlier this spring, um, given the long-term uh, future-oriented nature of regional growth strategy planning, a number of our projects rely on grant funding. And so we have some commitments around turnaround times and we have some commitments to our community partners about delivering these projects in a timely way. So I would suggest that um, the, the existence of that grant funding does elevate the priority for some of our projects. So we've talked about the housing strategy, we've talked about air quality tonight. I'm not gonna delve into any of those things, either of those things, unless you would like me to do so. Um, and I'll just jump right into the poverty reduction strategy. So as you know, we are the lucky recipients of $100,000 from the province um, administered through UBCM to undertake a local poverty reduction strategy. So what is that? Um, the province has introduced a provincial poverty reduction strategy and accompanying legislation. So our goal is to develop a Comox Valley specific strategy that is going to help us implement the provincial targets locally. And so that means, in terms of targets, a 25% reduction over 2016 levels of our overall poverty rate by 2024, and among children who are living in poverty, to reduce the number of those children by 50% by 2024. Um, thank you to each uh, of the municipal directors for uh, supporting this work through your municipal councils and enabling us to do this as a regional project. Municipal staff um, have identified limited capacity to participate in this project, and that's okay. We will accommodate that. Um, we're all experiencing challenges uh, anyway, but, but sharpened by COVID, and, and we will accommodate those, um, those schedules uh, accordingly. Our real interest there is to make sure that we're doing this together. Everyone can get behind the project, and we end up with both a process and a product that everyone has some ownership for and feels like it reflects the needs of our community and the direction that you want us to go. We'll be working with um, key community partners again on this project, specifically the Social Planning Society, the Community Health Network, and the Coalition to End Homelessness. And I've uh, met with those folks again recently, and they are all very keen to proceed. Uh, next steps for this project include scoping and retaining a consultant to help us with this work. And one thing that we're going to do uh, this with this particular project is establish a poverty reduction um, advisory committee. I'm using that term really loosely. Um, this is meant to be a citizens committee, uh, citizens with, with expertise in the area, including those with lived experience of poverty. And the grant funding on this uh, project requires us to complete the work by June of 2021. In respect to active transportation, um, as you know, we, this is on our list because it is a board strategic priority. We are awaiting a decision, a final decision, on our application to do a regional active transportation network plan. We had, I think it's fair to say, a bit of a premature provincial press release come out suggesting that we were successful recipients. And I'm just working with staff now to confirm that, in fact, we did receive support for a region-wide plan and not just for electoral area B on Hornby, as was identified in the provincial press release. So stay tuned for that. At a minimum, however, we do have um, a gap analysis that you endorse through the RGS budget process to do that regionally. And I'll be working closely with, with Mike, um, making sure that we, we hit the transit interest that you have uh, as part of active transportation or supporting active transportation. As we've discussed already tonight, active transportation, of course, is a key um, or is, is closely related to mitigating both poverty, but also air quality improvement. Uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time or a lot of focus and perhaps our public is, is largely focused on the impact of, of wood smoke, but um, certainly congestion is also a major contributor. 
So all of these, of course, are linked to the social determinants of health. Um, and so staff would suggest to you that this work should continue to be a priority uh, in our renewal plan. Um, I expect that staff, municipal staff, pardon me, will similarly have li limited capacity uh, to participate in this project. And again, the need for their um, you know, direct involvement is, if, if that needs to be limited, that's okay. But again, where we do wanna make sure is that we're checking in and that everybody's on board. And so that we uh, have both a process and a product that everyone can get behind. Um, one of our big projects, our exciting projects, and we have a video that uh, we've retained Fox and B to produce for us, is education um, and outreach on our regional growth strategy. This was another of your strategic priorities uh, that is proving almost like at the risk of sounding dramatic every day to be really important in supporting the other projects that we do. Um, so Lisa, on very short notice, uh, was able to get that video ready uh, to show you. So if you could put that on, please. And this will be a key tool um, as part of our public program that we'll be launching uh, next week. Thanks, Lisa. Do you love living in the Comox Valley? Do you ever wonder how multiple local governments work together to make our communities better? It's through our regional growth strategy. The RGS represents our collective vision for how to manage growth and community impacts over the long term. It's a commitment to work together across government boundaries to tackle challenges that affect us all. The goals of the RGS are complete communities to ensure the needs of Comox Valley residents are met through affordable and accessible housing, transportation, and community services enabled by thoughtful community design. Environmental stewardship to protect, steward, and enhance our natural environment and ecological systems local economy to achieve a sustainable, resilient, and dynamic local economy that supports local businesses, multimodal transportation to develop an accessible, efficient, and affordable multimodal transportation network connecting core settlement areas and designated town centers and linking the Comox Valley to neighboring communities, growth management to direct growth to existing core settlement areas and protect rural areas in order to create the right conditions for affordable, effective, and efficient public services that conserve land, water, and energy. Food systems to support the local agricultural and aquaculture sectors and increase local food security. Health and wellness to support a high quality of life through the protection and enhancement of community health, safety, and well-being. Climate change to minimize regional greenhouse gas emissions and plan for adaptation. Get to know your regional growth strategy and how it promotes thoughtful living. To learn more about the CVRD's RGS, visit connectcvrd.ca slash RGS or call 250-334-6000. Thanks very much, Lisa. So like in many of the other services that you're seeing, we've shifted all of that outreach and education to online platforms. Um, and um, this, is, this is the beginning. So we've created uh, on the CBRD website, a Connect CBRD page, where we'll have a listing of all of our projects and then invite residents to chime in uh, with feedback and questions, et cetera, on each of those projects. Another key project uh, on your strategic priority list that we would like to proceed with, although our work has been slowed down slightly, um, is on the, our monitoring and evaluation framework. So uh, we continue to um, uh, support, uh, of course, the idea that um, accurate and reliable data is critical to the decisions that you're making um, and will be throughout uh, the response phase, uh, or pardon me, the renewal phase of the pandemic. So through the development of a digital dashboard, ideally with open source data, we are trying to make um, data-driven decisions easier for you. Uh, the report notes that this, is, this project has been slightly delayed and that's really just a staff resource thing. It's not particularly COVID related, but uh, we expect to have some draft uh, material available for you to review by year end. The next set of um, functional tasks within our list, I'm gonna talk about one uh, in particular that staff is suggesting we might wanna take another look at, and that is the RGS five-year review. So provincial legislation requires that at least once every five years, the board consider whether or not to undertake a comprehensive review of its RGS. And the board last considered whether or not to do this in 2017, and as you know, opted not to do so. 
So although the board, this board has not initiated a review of the RGS, um, staff, uh, both municipal and here at the CBRD, we've been talking about our ability to undertake this work, the scope of a review in the context of COVID renewal. Um, and all have suggested that this would be a challenge from a workload perspective, but also from the perspective of our, our community's ability to engage in this scale of a task. Um, we, as staff, were suggesting that we focus on completing the key projects that I've outlined um, just now. And those projects and those findings, and as well as the relationships and processes that we're developing through those projects, that will set you in our, on, a, on a really good platform to undertake a review, to consider initiation of a review uh, in 2022. Um, there is one item that I've included in the um, uh, section on evaluate the concept. This is a small dollar project, but I think given the discussion earlier about transit, um, I, I do want to raise it for your attention. The electric vehicle strategy, this arises out of um, 2018 decision on the use of carbon offset funds wherein you identify $9,000 for the development of an electric vehicle strategy. Um, and staff it was suggesting through this report that you might want to consider holding off on that until such time as you may make a decision about doing a regional multimodal Folsom plan. Um, but certainly open to your feedback on that given tonight's discussion. So all of our engagement, as I noticed, has shifted to online opportunities, um, including the launch of the video and the related Connect CBRD page. And for each project, we are staffing the degree to which uh, both the public and our specific community partners are able to support RGS projects via their um, engagement levels. So as you know, uh, the RGS is quite a lean service to begin with. Many of these projects derive their funding, their primary funding from grant sources. Uh, we will continue to apply the COVID lens uh, to work plan items, including the fact that this disruption has highlighted a key role for local government in responding to the social and economic inequalities that have impacted our community's resilience, and as other uh, prolonged disruptions will do yeah, in future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alana. Are there any questions, comments? Yep, I got a comment. Director Frisch. Thanks, and thanks, Alana, for the report. Um, I was just going to make a comment about the electric uh, vehicle strategy. Um, I would probably agree that um, we could put it off and, and do it as part of a larger strategy. Um, I also know that um, the city of Courtney is waiting on some applications, I think, that the RD took part in as well for her. So um, it seems like things are a little bit on hold anyways, so I wouldn't... Um, I don't think it would it would be a poor decision to hold off on that, even though it's a small number. Um, oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, really? I must have missed it. <laughs> so we're getting all those charging stations. Well, that's exciting. Nonetheless, I'm sure we could uh, we could wait a little bit on the other part. Thank you, Director Arbor. Um. Yeah, thanks. I'll I'll take. A, I guess like Trish and I are following each other tonight. But I, I'll, on that one, I guess we're supposed to learn about that grant that we we were with the Nanaimo Regional District uh, for the electrical vehicle strategy, and and I think we were gonna hear about that grant last December, and now we're here. I'm I'm just hoping it's not in staff's mind holding off other initiatives because I saw the charging stations with the sports commission being delayed and deferred. And you heard my comments earlier about us putting in a lot of money in transit and we're deferring a $9,000 project that could really help the 70 or 80% of people that use uh, cars to make the transition to a climate change friendly solution. So no, I would, I would really like to see this project move forward um, if, uh, if we get the grant, uh, this month, uh, with the Nanaimo regional district, that's great. Then we have a process to do it. I don't need to talk about it. If we don't, I would suggest that we don't lose this piece, uh, and, uh, or lose it to a, a larger process. I think I would, I would like to see some action on that, but that's my personal preference. Thank you. Did 
does staff want to respond? Uh, through the chair to the directors, we are still waiting a decision on that grant that we made as the Mid Island Collective. Um, perhaps you you have a source of information, so so that's great. Uh, we do know that um, so the CDRD made an application. Uh, Mike, help me out here on the numbers, but but Courtney Cumberland and Comox also made applications. So uh, Michael and I recently had a call with the um, BC Sustainable Energy Association, and that, that those are the folks that that spearheaded the application on our behalf, um, and they indicated that. Um, uh, a decision would be forthcoming end of the month. I I, I thought I had heard it, um, from one of our staff that it had been approved, but if you haven't heard, perhaps that was uh, perhaps I'm mistaken in that. But uh, it certainly has been a long time. I had thought just the last couple of weeks it had been approved, but I guess we'll see. Okay. Um, since we've, um, we're discussing the, the review of the RGS and, and putting that off to 2022, um, I was just wondering if the funding remains there to do that review in that year or if um, we need to build up that funding. Um, through the chair to the directors. So uh, you'll remember that that first critical step is for the board to initiate the review. So previously, we had thought that we would be coming with you to you in this budget cycle, you know, beginning in fall and talk about numbers for funding that review. So there isn't specifically money allocated within the budget for the review. What we did talk about earlier, and I think is still a good plan, is that you've allocated money for these projects that are going to give or drive a lot of the content for that review. Um, so there, there are no changes uh, recommended there. Um, we are looking at other opportunities for uh, for funding of a review. It's um, depending on the scope that you you give us for for that review will largely determine the budget. But uh, there are a number of sources uh, that other local governments have access that we have not explored, including gas tax funding um, to undertake a review. So we would be coming back uh, depending on your um, direction about timing with funding sources. Thanks. Appreciate that, Director Hillian. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, it, it strikes me that that's um, uh, maybe a topic for another day for some more in-depth discussion. Uh, I, I don't recall us having any detailed discussion about it um, here at this table during this particular term, but um, uh, I think it's important that we all understand uh, fully what's involved in, in, uh, in a review if, if one is proposed and, and uh, we have some time to digest that and make a proper decision. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? We on receipt? Okay. Anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing and hearing them, that's carried. And there is a recommendation. Second the recommendation. Okay, and the recommendation is that the COVID-19 response and renewal plan for the regional growth strategy course service as included with the staff report dated July 3rd, 2020 be approved. Any further comments? Okay, I'll go through the list. Director Arbor. In favor. Director Frisch. In favor. Director Hamir. In favor. Director Hillian. In favor. Director Grant. In favor. Director Grieve. In favor. Director Morin. In favor. Director Swift. In favor. Director Cole Hamilton. In favor. Thank you, that's unanimous. And we move on to item seven, which is the Comox Valley Water and Wastewater Mutual Aid Agreement. Move receipt. Thank you, and I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Chris LaRose is here to explain the mutual aid agreement and the recommendation provided to the board and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Russell. Hello again, everyone. Uh, so this report follows up on um, the approval of the interregional mutual aid agreement uh, approved by the board this spring. And, uh, and uh, an update on progress of the Comox Valley Regional District towards compliance with Ministerial Order 84, requiring local authorities to enter into mutual aid agreements with neighboring jurisdictions to ensure continuity of water and wastewater services uh, during the pandemic. So since the start of the pandemic, all the local water and sewer purveyors in the Valley have met on a regular basis <clears throat> to compare notes on uh, COVID protocols and, and impacts. And, um, and we've, we've been maintaining an inventory of available resources with the aim of supporting each other 
should any of the purveyors fall below the emergency staffing levels identified early on in the, in the, uh, in the pandemic. So initially all members of this group agreed to part participate in a local mutual aid agreement to formalize this support. Um, however, after the draft document was reviewed by legal counsel um, at, at the city and the town, uh, both opted out of the local mutual aid agreement because they feel that the existing emergency mutual aid agreement provides sufficient coverage. The other local partners, including the CBRD, the Village of Cumberland, the Coox First Nation, Union Bay Improvement District, and the Ships Point Improvement District, all still see value in proceeding with the local water and wastewater mutual aid agreement and the draft documents attached to this report for your review and approval. So the document is almost identical to the interregional mutual aid agreement that was brought forward and approved this spring. So it includes a formal process for the signatories to request help should they need it, should their staffing levels fall below emergency levels. Um, payment for any help that is provided is provided on a actual cost basis, so no, no profit. Um, and lastly, signatories are only required to provide help if their own staff, staffing levels are adequate to ensure their own continuity of service. So that's it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions. I see Director Arbor. Thanks, Chris. I was really happy to see that proceed and, and uh, during COVID that made so much sense. My only question is, um, does this only apply to the water and wastewater operators or does it uh, include um, the administrative services that uh, support those services with those smaller functions or organizations? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I believe it's, it applies to operators um, and equipment and it doesn't specifically mention administrative or management staff. Um, however, I, I don't think there's anything precluding um, that type of help being, being requested or proffered under the agreement. Thanks so much, Chris. Great work. Director Krish. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So I'm, I'm curious about um, the earlier mutual agreement that you talked about that we must have seen at the board. Yep. Um, and I think I remember it. So two things, th this one doesn't um, necessarily supersede it. It uh, is a secondary or a second one. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I should have maybe provided a little bit more background there. It's been a, a couple months. So that, that other one was uh, interregional. So it was, um, it was between us, the CVRD, uh, the RDN, the other CVRD, um, and the ACRD. Okay. Alberta Nuclear Corp. Yeah. So there was, um, sorry, and the city of, uh, of Nanaimo as well. So it was interregional with Point South. Um, so, the, and this one is completely complementary. It provides the local, you know, we have, we have, a, we now have a mutual aid agreement with those Southern partners <coughs> at, the, at that level. And we, and now we're through this agreement um, proposing to provide that same level of comfort to the smaller. Uh, local purveyors here. Okay, and so maybe you can just outline for me, um, you know, some of the reasons why Courtney might not be a part of this one. Yeah. So the so their perspective, your perspective, is that um, is that the, so there isn't since uh, 2017 2018 there's been an emergency mutual aid agreement in place that um, that covers I mean the full I think the full range of of, of services, um, although. It, I'm not sure that it specifically mentions water and wastewater, but um, but the, their interpretation is that the that agreement, that existing agreement that still has an, another year before it expires, um, is sufficient. That in the event that they do um, experience a drop in in resources below the emergency staffing levels, that they could call up, using that a document, call upon those resources. So there's a couple of things. One is that um, it's not super you know, it's not very specific to water and wastewater there would there would be additional paperwork required to articulate the request beyond above what would be required um, in this uh, this specific and focused mutual aid agreement and then also that emergency mutual aid agreement my understanding is it only covers the four local governments it doesn't cover you know, Comox first nation and um, UBIT and and, and um, ships point so um, I, we don't we don't have any concerns with with this the way that this is rolled out. I think 
I think um, the existing emergency mutual aid agreement does provide coverage. Um, and I think you know, in a way this is, you know, this, this, these three mutual aid agreements are complement to each, to, each, to each other. Okay, thank yeah. you. I'm really happy to see this uh, come forward. I think it's really important. There's um, the technical expertise that it takes um, with the technicians at the higher levels um, for uh, water and wastewater uh, treatment. Um, th those people are few and far between. So if, if something happens to them, it, um, they get ill from COVID, for example, it's, it's really nice to have that um, backup and, and this um, aid agreement. So I'm very happy to see it come forward. Are there any further comments, questions? Okay, I think we are on receipt. Is there anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing none, that's carried. And there's a recommendation. Move. Second. Thank you. And it's that the board enter into a mutual aid agreement with the village of Vermont's First Nation, Union Bay Improvement District, and Ships Point Improvement District to enable the continuity of wastewater and drinking water services according to the provincial order M084. I'll go through the list. Director Arbor. Totally. Director Frisch. In favor. Director Hamir. In favor. Director Hillian. In favor. Director Grant. In favor. Director Grieve. Absolutely. Director Morin. In favor. Director Swift. In favor. Director Cole Hamilton. In favor. Thank you. That's unanimous. And we're on to item eight grant status report. Oversee. Second. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And the grant status report is a regular item to be provided to you. Uh, Kevin DeVell is here to answer any of your questions. Otherwise, it's just for information. Director Arbor, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Just a quick one. Um, are we batting 100%? Because uh, I, I never see a category for grants declined. And I'm wondering if it's if it's just a habit that we don't report on grants that were declined. But as elected official, as I'm sure as CEO, there's just so many things we have to think about. And I, I would like to actually see the information of grants that are declined because it may trigger new action or consideration by the board. We're a positive bunch and we look at the success, but uh, we'll take that into consideration uh, in, in future reports. Thank you for your suggestion. Thanks. Any further comments, questions? Anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that carries. And we are on to bylaws and resolutions for first, second, and third reading. I'll move uh, bylaw number 617 for first, second, and third reading. Just two. Just for first and second? Yeah. Just for first and second, that's what I meant. Thank you. And that's the sewage service expansion principles bylaw. Is there any comments on that? Okay, I'll go through the list. This is for Courtney and Comox. So Director Frisch. In favor. Director Hillian. In favor. Director Grant. In favor. Director Morin. In favor. Director Swift. In favor. Director Cole Hamilton. In favor. That's unanimous, thank you. And second. Thank you. So third reading for the same bunch, Director Frisch. In favor. Director Hillian. In favor. Director Grant. In favor. Director Morin. In favor. Director Swift. In favor. Director Cole Hamilton. In favor. Unanimous, thank you. And on to final adoption. I'll move that uh, bylaw number 618 um, be finally adopted. Second. Thank you. And bylaw 618 is the Comox Valley Regional District Officer Bylaw. And it's a vote of the full board. So, no. Oh, is there a comment? Director Grant, your mic's on. Is that okay? So starting with Director Arbor. I had a, I had a quick comment before I vote. Okay. 
be because we're remote, maybe this was done already, but I'd, I'd like, uh, I, I noticed there's probably going to be a new name as an officer, and I'd like to welcome our new CFO to uh, the regional district. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, Mariah Fort had to leave a little earlier, so is not here in the meeting, but we'll pass that on. Cheers. Okay, so back to the vote, Director. In favor. In, in favor. Thank you. Director Frisch? In favor. Director Hamir? In favor. Director Hillian? In favor. Director Grant? In favor. Director Grieve? In favor. Director Morin? In favor. Director Swift? In. Director Cole Hamilton? In favor. And that's unanimous, thank you. And that brings us to new business. Move receipt. Of external appointment update. Second. Thank you. And I will pass it over to Director Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll try to keep this fairly brief as I know we've got a very brief in-camera following and hopefully we'll eat after this report. Um, so I, I, I'm the CBRD's representative to the uh, Vancouver Island Coastal Communities Cl Climate Leadership Plan uh, Steering Committee, it's a short name. Um, and uh, the the area that covered is kind of coextensive with ABICC, so it's the island, all the regional districts on the island and on the coast from uh, Sunshine Coast North up to Haida Gwaii. And the idea has been to try and create a regional climate plan. The, kind of the first step that was taken a little while ago was to was the, um, the regional analysis, which was uh, attached to the report. And it's really quite a remarkable document in terms of looking at uh, our region on a number of different levels. Uh, so if you do have the time, I'd thoroughly recommend taking a look at that, that document and a second document, which is a, um, a uh, survey. Um, both these were prepared by um, two uh, UVic professors who, uh, through the Pacific Institute for Climate Studies, have been supporting the group and producing amazing work. The survey went out to elected officials and staff in the region in May, and uh, there'll be a report back at the next meeting, which is in, on August 10th, and looking forward to hearing that. And those documents will provide the foundation for discussion at a conference, which is gonna be held virtually uh, in November, on November 6th. So I'll report back again after the August meeting, but uh, it's the process is it's very ably led by Josie Osborne and uh, Lisa Helps and Michelle Staples from uh, from Duncan, and um, despite the difficulties of COVID, it's moving ahead really well. So I'll uh, you know probably just leave it at that. As I imagine, there's food in the other room. I certainly hope there is. So thank you. Are there any questions, comments, Director Hillian? Thanks, Chair. I'd just like to uh, uh, thank Director Cole Hamilton for his work on this and uh, compliment him on an incredibly well-written and thoughtful letter. Thank you. Yeah, and if you have a chance, there's some really good information in that uh, territorial analysis. Um, and so that was just for receipt. Anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that passes. And that'll take us to- Move termination. In camera. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice try. Yeah. You're looking thin though, <laughs> all of a sudden. Uh, move that we go in camera, or we already did that, I guess. We the did, beginning, yeah. Didn't we? We'll just wait for 